Prehistoric Planet is a paleontology documentary series currently available to stream on Apple TV+. It was produced by the BBC with Jon Favreau acting as showrunner and is presented and narrated by the one and only Sir David Attenborough, whose contributions to the natural sciences cannot be understated. Prehistoric Planet is, in my opinion, the greatest paleontology documentary series since the Walking With series concluded in 2005. The visual effects were done by MPC, and to say they did a good job would be a massive understatement. Practically every single creature is so beautifully textured and composited over stunning real-life backdrops. They are fluently animated, and their behaviour is so believable, I'm convinced they went back in time and filmed real dinosaurs. So far, there are two seasons, with five episodes each. For season one, one episode was released per day from Monday the 23rd to Friday the 27th of May 2022. The same was done for the second season a year later, from Monday the 22nd to Friday the 26th of May 2023. Each season consists of five episodes, each focusing on multiple different ecosystems of the late Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago, united by a common theme. For season one, these are coasts, deserts, freshwater, ice worlds, and forests. As opposed to the more complex single narratives per episode of, say, Walking with Dinosaurs, Prehistoric Planet's structure is more reminiscent of the multiple simpler stories showcased in the Planet Earth series, for example. Another way it differs from documentaries like Walking with Dinosaurs and When Dinosaurs Roamed America is that it focuses solely on one time period, that being the Maastrichtian stage of the late Cretaceous around 66 million years ago, rather than telling the entire story of the Mesozoic era. Whilst I personally like the style of those documentaries more, that's simply my preference, as I don't think one approach is better than the other. In fact, I think focusing purely on one time helps flesh out the global ecosystems of the Maastrichtian. My usual habit of critiquing the outdated or inaccurate reconstructions of prehistoric animals in paleomedia in my videos isn't quite going to be the case here, as Prehistoric Planet is dedicated to reconstructing animals in the most up-to-date, scientifically accurate, and behaviorally plausible ways possible. I'd say about 90-95% to of the time, they succeed with flying colours. The hiccups that are present are few and far between, and I will be pointing those out as I go through all 10 episodes of the first two seasons of the show in depth. Without further ado, let's do just that as we delve into the first episode of the first season of Prehistoric Planet. Episode 1, Coasts, is actually the least dinosaur-centric episode of Season 1. A bold way to start, I have to say. As such, the main stars are in fact the marine reptiles like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, as well as numerous flying pterosaurs. Each episode of Season 1 consists of six distinct scenes, except for forests, which has seven for some reason taking place in various places all over the globe. The first scene is the most iconic of the entire show. It stars the poster boy himself, and the only actual dinosaur in this episode, the Daddy T-Rex, whom the community has christened Hank, taking his offspring for a swim in Hell's Aquarium? The narration states that this scene takes place on the, quote, southern shores of the inland sea that splits North America, which leads me to believe that whilst not explicitly stated, this scene may be set in the Laramie Formation of Colorado, as Tyrannosaurus fossils have been found there, and it would have been situated on the southern coast of the Western Interior Seaway. I applaud this scene for doing something I imagine many paleoenthusiasts thought impossible. It makes T-Rex interesting. 
There's a reason it's so iconic. Where else would you see a male T-Rex swimming with his brood of chicks to then be usurped by another predator? Nowhere. The fact that Prehistoric Planet manages to subvert your expectations right out of the gate is so impressive to me. Speaking of impressive, it's about time we talk about the creature models. I don't think it's exaggerating to call these the best looking extinct animals ever put to screen. Practically every individual scale is visible. They look... real. I think that's the biggest compliment I could ever give to a documentary with CGI animals. They're not just detailed though. They are beautifully textured and coloured with every animal bearing distinct patterns and markings. They are simply breathtaking. As for Tyrannosaurus itself, whose name of course means Tyrant Lizard, it has a very naturalistic mottled dark earthy brown colour with a cream underbelly. This is also a far cry from the very spindly looking T-Rex from Walking With Dinosaurs and Prehistoric Park. This truly looks like a 40 foot long, 8 ton predator capable of biting through bone. Hank is an absolute chonker and I love it. So does the internet apparently, to a point where some say he has a dad bod. Which is a little weird, but it resulted in memes like this so I can't complain. This also sets the bar for what we can expect from the dinosaurs in Prehistoric Planet. Non-pronated wrists, no shrink wrapping, appropriate feather covering, and lips. I know lips on dinosaurs is an ongoing debate, but from what I've seen, lips seem to be favoured overall, so that's all I'll say on that front. All the common errors so many docs fall victim to are nowhere to be found, and that is a breath of fresh air, and they all look fantastic. Not only do we get an awesome adult model, but the juveniles too, and they are appropriately leggy and have feathers. They're also much more lightly coloured than the adults and have really striking patchy markings. It really is so refreshing seeing T-Rex just being a parent. Though I question Hank's choice of outing for his kids, as I personally wouldn't take my kids out on a day trip for a swim in arguably the most dangerous sea in the Earth's history. Regardless, we see the family out in open water, swimming to one of the many offshore islands. Coasts uses a fair amount of modern animal footage, which I think is understandable, as many species of animals such as fish would be too small and inconsequential to the story to warrant modelling and animating. Swimming below them are some unidentified sea turtles. These seem to be members of the extinct family Protostegidae, whose closest living relative is the leatherback sea turtle. This is reflected in the model by their shells resembling their leathery carapaces rather than the bony shells of other sea turtles. Whilst no protostegids are known from Maastrichtian North America, fossils of the family have been found dating to this time. As such, it's reasonable to assume they were also in North America during this time. Based on how the beak has been reconstructed, it seems they were modelled on the genus Archelon which is only known from the previous Campanian stage of the Cretaceous. It's important to keep in mind that the fossil record only gives us a tiny glimpse into the past, so it's entirely possible that Archelon lived into the Maastrichtian, and that's what these turtles are. As such, if we assume they are based on Archelon's dimensions, they would be roughly 12 feet long and wide. Whatever they are, they look fantastic, and I'm so glad they were included at all. Then, to the surprise of nobody, I imagine, Hank and his brood are attacked by a Mosasaur. Whilst not explicitly stated as such, I'm inclined to think this is meant to be Mosasaurus Hoffmanii, as they were geographically present in North America during the Maastrichtian. I'll talk more about this creature later though. Hank reaches the island minus one chick, also he could snack on the rotten carcass of a giant turtle. Was there no food on the mainland? I wonder what killed this turtle? Maybe a mosasaur? Or maybe just natural causes? 
Hank then refuses to share his food with his kids, I guess teaching them independence. In all seriousness, it's to teach them how to catch their own food, which comes in the form of hatchling protostegids, live acted by modern sea turtle hatchlings, the species of which I'm struggling to ID. If you know more about turtles than I do, please let me know in the comments. The young T-Rex are so well implemented into the scene. Their interactions look so convincing whilst they're chasing the turtles. In the second scene, we head to North Africa to see an impressive variety of pterosaurs. This scene is based on fossil finds from the Ouled Abdoum Basin in Morocco. Here we are introduced to a nesting colony of Tethy Draco and in amongst them, the Ajdarkid Phosphata Draco, looking for unattended hatchlings to eat. Tethy Draco, whose name means Tethys Dragon, after the Tethys Sea that covered the region at the time, are reconstructed here as Pteranodontids, with head crests very similar to Pteranodon. Tethy Draco is only known from limb bones, so much of this reconstruction is speculative, but I think making them most similar to their closest relatives was a sensible decision, even showcasing sexual dimorphism, which is excellent. They also have a unique juvenile model, which is brilliant. Tethy Draco is estimated to have had a 15 foot wingspan, and as to be expected with the lightweight build of pterosaurs, weighed around 15 kilograms. Until the discovery of Tethy Draco and two of the other genera we'll talk about in a little bit, it was thought that pterosaur diversity had dropped considerably by the late Cretaceous, due to being outcompeted by birds, with the only family left being the giant Ashdarkids. Their discovery showed that pterosaurs were in fact much more diverse at the end of the Cretaceous than previously thought. Whilst originally assigned to the family Pteranodontidae, a paper published on a wing discovered in 2020 assigned to Tethy Draco suggested that it may have actually been an Ashdarkid, potentially even synonymous with Phosphata Draco. A second paper from 2022, however, described a new pterosaur genus dated to around the same time from Angola, Epipatello. The researchers found the material referred to this genus was very similar to that known for Tethy Draco and Pteranodon, so the Pteranodon-esque reconstruction for Tethy Draco still seems reasonable to me. Here I should also mention that, like with the T-Rex of the first scene, this sets the baseline for pterosaurs in the show. Appropriately covered in pycnofibers, no shrink wrapping, and their forelimbs are appropriately folding their wings over their backs, with their hands facing backwards whilst grounded, which we know from trackways. The second pterosaur genus, Phosphata Draco, whose name means dragon from the phosphate, has a really striking coloration, which I think is based on the secretary bird. It is confidently assigned to the family Ashdarkidae, and it follows the most recently supported theory that they were terrestrial predators like modern storks. Just enormous. Phosphata Draco was actually only of modest size for Ashdarkids, with wingspan estimates ranging from 13 to 16 feet, less than half that of its giant relatives Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsagopteryx, who we'll be talking about in future episodes. On an offshore sea stack, we are introduced to a third genus, Alcyone, named after Alcyone from Greek mythology, who was transformed into a seabird by Zeus. Whilst the juveniles are the real stars of this scene, if you look closely, you can actually see some adults amongst the colony seen earlier. Much like Tethy Draco, Alcyone's classification has had a little remodeling, whilst originally assigned to the family Nyctosauridae, the same paper mentioned earlier, describing Epipatello, defined a new, more inclusive group, Aponyctosauria. This group includes the family Nyctosauridae, as well as Epipatello, Alcyone, and the latter's contemporary, Simorgia. Assuming a defining trait of Nyctosauridae, their lack of non-wing fingers, is the basal condition for Aponyctosauria as a whole, I don't have any issues with this reconstruction of Alcyone. I like how different the juveniles look to the adults, as they are a mix of white and brown with a dark grey bill, whereas the adults are coloured like blue-footed boobies. Adult Alcyone are smaller pterosaurs, estimated to have wingspans of roughly 6 to 7 feet. 
I love how they show the recent discovery of pterosaurs laying soft-shelled eggs like turtles with the Alcyone nests, consisting of seaweed to keep them moist, an excellent touch. It also showcases how pterosaurs had different parenting strategies. The Tethydraco are shown to be K-strategists, that is, having few offspring but providing them with food and protection. The Alcyone are shown as R-strategists, having many offspring but providing no parental care. Once they all hatch, they climb to the top of the stack and fly to the forest on the top of the cliff behind the colony. This showcases the most recent theory that pterosaurs took off by launching themselves with their powerful front limbs and is beautifully animated to boot. On the way, however, they are attacked by the fourth pterosaur, Barbary Dactylus, whose name means Barbary Finger after the Barbary coast of North Africa. This genus is confidently assigned to the Nyctosauridae, but the validity of the actual genus was questioned in a paper in 2022, where it was suggested that it may represent a species of Nyctosaurus, but I'm unsure how well supported this theory is. Whilst not known, the skull was reconstructed with a very similar antler-esque head crest to Nyctosaurus, which I think is a sensible decision. We will see some sexual dimorphism in this genus in the next episode too. Estimates for Barbarodactylus' wingspan are around 13 feet. Whilst there's no fossil evidence for pterosaurs eating smaller pterosaurs, as far as I know, the narration does state that Barbarodactylus usually feeds on fish and squid, and the baby Alcyone are the right size for being on the menu. Because it's hard to see here, I'll talk more about their coloration in the next episode. We see the Alcyone partake in some really cool evasive maneuvers by folding their wings to drop quickly. This is risky, however, as they lose altitude. We see one hatchling crash land on the beach, only to then be eaten by the Phosphato Draco, a good payoff from its introduction earlier. After several being picked off by the assaulting Barbary Dactylus, we see several Alcyone just barely make it to the safety of the trees where they will stay until adulthood, which is foreshadowed when we see a small flock of adults from between the branches. A fantastic segment and my personal favourite from this episode. In the third scene, we go to the shallow seas of Zealandia, which for those who don't know, is the proposed name for the recently discovered, mostly submerged piece of continental crust, including New Zealand and New Caledonia that may even be a true continent. Specifically, this scene appears to be set in the Tahora Formation of New Zealand's North Island. This segment focuses on the plesiosaur Tarangisaurus, whose name comes from the Maori word for ancient and the Greek word for lizard, Maori being the language of the indigenous Maori people of New Zealand. Again, I must applaud this episode for highlighting obscure species Whilst they have the household names of T-Rex and Mosasaurus in there, every other creature in this episode is obscure, even to paleo-enthusiasts like myself. Tarangisaurus was a medium-sized plesiosaur, at roughly 26 feet long, and are reconstructed pretty much how you would expect elasmosaurs to be. Tiny heads on the end of incredibly long necks, four powerful flippers that paddle in an alternating pattern to swim, and the more recent finding that they also featured a small tail fluke. Something I do want to say now for future reference is that whilst a lot of the advertising for the show states that it is set 66 million years ago, a fair number of the animals featured did not live during this very specific point in time, but did live during the Maastrichtian age of the late Cretaceous, which lasted from 72 to 66 million years ago. I believe it's worth assuming that much like how most of the creatures in the Jurassic Park and World films aren't actually from the Jurassic period, Prehistoric Planet is instead set during the Maastrichtian age as a whole and not just 66 million years ago. I bring this up now as Tarangisaurus is an example of this, as it is only known from 72 to 68 million years ago. Alternatively, we can also keep in mind that the fossil record does only give us the tiniest glimpse into the past, so maybe these animals were in fact around 66 million years ago as well. 
we just haven't found evidence to prove as such. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So for me at least, if it lived in the Maastrichtian age, it gets a pass from me. Going back to the episode, they picked a beautiful filming location for the scene of a coastal bay where a waterfall meets the sea. A pod of tyrannosaurs are here both for the males to display to the females by raising their long necks up and out of the water, which looks super cool, but also to swallow pebbles smoothened from weathering in their journey downriver. For a while, it was assumed that plesiosaurs swallowed stones to act as ballast to counteract the air in their lungs. More recently, it was suggested that they were used as gizzard stones to help grind up the fish they ate. Prehistoric Planet makes the reasonable conclusion that they were multifunctional and acted as both. The lighting for this scene is gorgeous, and once again we have differing models for the same species at different growth stages. I don't have much to say about this scene other than it's solid and really pretty. The fourth scene is a fan favourite, and for good reason. This segment is set in a reef in the shallow sea of southern Europe, but as for a specific location, I have no idea, as the two species featured here have either a wide distribution or are hard to classify. As such, we are introduced to a pycnodont fish. The pycnodontiforms were a very successful group of marine fish that lived from the Triassic period around 230 million years ago all the way to the Eocene Epoch around 35 million years ago. They were mainly reef dwellers with teeth adapted for crushing tough foods such as crustaceans. The specific genus isn't named as it's probably just meant to be a generic pycnodont, but I guess we could label it as Anomoedus, as its fossils were found in France from around this time. We see one rock in the reef is devoid of coral due to the rubbing abrasion of Mosasaurus hoffmanii, or Hoffman's Mosasaur as Sir David calls it, which is interesting to think about giving extinct animals common names too. On the whole, the Mosasaurus whose name means Muse River Lizard, has a wonderful model, but some of the finer details aren't quite right for M. Hoffmanii. Firstly, the flippers might be a bit too small and thin for an animal this huge. The main critiques, however, concern the head. For one, it seems to be missing its ears, which is odd. The tooth row is shown to curve outwards, whereas Mosasaurs had straight tooth rows. The snout also seems to be too short and narrow for M. Hoffmanii, which had a longer and broad snout. These are small details though, and on the whole, it's still probably the best Mosasaurus put to screen. This huge male has a wonderful red coloration on his back for the mating season, much like modern lizards do. He is said to be over 15 tons, which seems reasonable for an animal almost 60 feet long. M. Hoffmanii's total length is difficult to estimate, as it is mainly known only from skulls. Extrapolating from this has resulted in estimates as short as 40 feet and as long as 60 feet. Exceptionally large individuals are known in modern animals, so I don't think it's that unreasonable for this 50 foot mosasaur to be extra huge if the 40 foot estimate is considered, or on the smaller side if the 60 foot estimate is considered. When he lands on the rock and opens his mouth to be cleaned, you can see awesome details such as the pterygoid teeth and the forked tongue, like its relatives, the snakes and the lizards. The practical effects of the mosasaur's shed skin look great, and it's almost cute seeing him roll around on this rock. Interestingly, the pycnodont fish switch to live-acted fish during the close-ups. After a thorough cleaning session, the old male's spa day is rudely interrupted by a younger rival male competing for his territory. We do have evidence for fighting amongst mosasaurs, as bite marks have been found on their skulls. It's hard to tell if this was inter or intra-specific aggression, but the latter would make sense and it's what's shown here. The younger male has blender coloration, perhaps showing his lack of experience. They're so amazingly well composited into the shots and their interactions with the water's surface are amazing. 
The old male manages to sneak in a breath and uses it to his advantage by dragging his rival down, attempting to drown him. In an awesome shot, we see them both disappear into the gloom before seeing the rival swim off and the older male triumphantly return to the surface. Much like with the T-Rex at the beginning, this scene manages to subvert the audience's expectations of these apex predators by showing them partaking in more mundane activities, and I think it's fantastic. The fifth scene takes us to the coast of North America, but doesn't specify if that means the Atlantic, Pacific or Gulf Coast, or one for the Inland Sea. If we want to be more specific, we may have to resort to biogeography in regards to the stars of this scene, Scaphited Ammonites. First off, it makes me so happy that Ammonites get their own scene in the first episode. Once again, we don't get a specific genus for these guys, but we have quite a few candidates. Scaphites, Disco Scaphites, and Raboceras. Whilst I'm sure these are just meant to be generic Scaphitids, they look quite similar to some species of Scaphites, so let's go with that. Like the majority of the things in the show, these are the best Ammonites ever put to screen. Here we see a mass gathering of them near the coast to mate and spawn. Here they are shown to select a partner by synchronizing an elaborate display of bioluminescence. There's no evidence of this of course, but considering their closest living relatives are squid and octopuses, which are famous for their ability to change colour and bioluminesce in the case of squids, I would be more surprised if ammonites didn't also have this ability. The fertilised egg sacs are then released by the females into the shallow waters, and much like modern squid, soon after mating, they die. This scene is so pretty, and again, I'm so happy that ammonites were the stars, they were even given a specific family. Not a genus, but eh, we'll get there soon enough. The sixth and final scene of Coasts brings us back again to Zealandia, where presumably the same pod of Tarangisaurs are attacked in deeper water by Kaikaifalu, a type of Mosasaur. Now, whilst I'm all for more obscure species, I am confused as to why they picked Kaikaifalu for this segment in Zealandia when it's only known from Antarctica, when Moanosaurus, a mosasaur contemporaneous with Tarangisaurus, also from the Tahora Formation in New Zealand, was right there. Granted, large marine animals can have incredibly wide ranges. This is even documented in mosasaurs, with mosasaurus being found all across the Atlantic, Tethys and Western Interior Sea. So it's not that out there to imagine a Kaikaifalu making it from Antarctica to Zealandia in my opinion. Weirdness aside, the model appears to be a slightly modified Mosasaurus, but I think it actually comes out slightly ahead in terms of accuracy, though still not quite perfect. Kaikaifalu is named after the god of water in the culture of the Mapuche people of South America, Kaikaivilu. It was slightly smaller than Mosasaurus, estimated at 33 feet long, and was more slenderly built. As such, I feel the model fits better for this animal, however, it and other Tylosaurine Mosasaurs had more pointed, slender snouts than what is shown here. So the Mosasaurus's skull is too narrow, and the Kaikaifalus is too broad. We can't win apparently. Once again, on the whole though, it's fantastic and I actually prefer the coloration with the white stripes down the tail to that of the Mosasaurus. This may also be the first time I've ever seen an Elasmosaur not just get completely bodied by a Mosasaur, with the pod actively and riskily mobbing the Kaikaifalu to drive it away from the pregnant mother, which is so cool. She then gives birth to an enormous baby, and it is well supported that the majority of marine reptiles, except for turtles, gave birth to live young at sea. The episode ends with the young Tyrannosaurus taking its first breath with its mother. An excellent note to end things on. So my closing thoughts on Kos are that it is a fantastic start to the show. Every single scene is great, be it painting old favourites in a new light, or showing off an awesome variety of obscure genera, easily one of my favourite episodes. 
episode two, Deserts, is my personal favourite episode of season one. Perhaps even the whole show, honestly. It starts out in South America, more specifically in or near to the Charo Fortaleza formation in southern Argentina. In the distant heat haze of the desert, we see a herd of the enormous titanosaur, Dreadnoughtus. One of the largest animals to have ever walked the earth, a staggering 85 feet long and weighing 50 tons. These are all males heading away from their usual forest habitat into the heart of a desert to compete for the right to mate with a harem of females. The model looks fantastic and I love the individual variation between the males and the sexual dimorphism too. The fiery red is such an awesome look for a sauropod. The leathery scale detail and skin folds all look superb and you really feel the weight of these immense animals. Juxtaposing these titans are the tiny and antiornith birds accompanying them. They go unnamed, but considering an antiornith's or opposite wing birds as they're also called, were the most successful group of birds in the Mesozoic, it's reasonable to assume these are what they are. None are known from Chero Fortaleza, but the geographically close Chorillo formation, dated to roughly the same time, was home to the genus Yetanavis, which was named and described as recently as 2022. If we're assuming these are enantioniths and we want to label them with a genus name, Yetanavis was geographically the closest known to Dreadnoughtus, so let's go with that. We'll be seeing a fair few of these kinds of birds throughout the show, but I'll talk more about them later. The male Dreadnoughtus eventually reach the females who judge the fitness of the newcomers. They attempt to impress with their most striking feature, pairs of speculative inflatable orange gula sacs running up the length of their necks. Now I'm sure there will be skeptics out there who think this is silly and or unreasonable speculation for a sauropod, but Honestly, I think it's remarkably conservative. Sauropods were extremely diverse and successful across the entire globe for over 100 million years. I would be more surprised if some of them hadn't developed some eccentric display structures for both sexual display and species recognition. As for the actual inflatable sacs, I think they're very reasonable organs for a sauropod to have, as their air sac system of breathing and respiring meant that their bones had plenty of air space, meaning they would already have plenty of air within them that could be pushed out into these inflatable structures. I applaud the creators for doing this, and I hope we get more plausible speculation like this in future paleo media. An old bull who has been dominating the harem for several weeks is challenged by one of the newcomers. I love how you can really see the difference in age between them from the more weathered and dusty looking bull. These two rear and shove each other hard, as well as biting each other's necks, which I've never seen sauropods do anywhere before, and stabbing one another with their thumb claws. It was once thought that titanosaurs like Dreadnoughtus had no claws on their hands. However, titanosaurs have now been found with hand claws, such as Diamantinosaurus from Australia, and it has been suggested that the apparent lack of claws is due to preservation bias and the claws being lost after death. As such, I don't have a problem with Dreadnoughtus being reconstructed with claws. It makes me so happy that we're finally seeing sauropods as more than just gentle giants. In fact, the paleontologist who discovered it, Kenneth Lacovara, chose the name Dreadnoughtus, which means fears nothing, because, quote, I think it's time the herbivores get their due for being the toughest creatures in an environment which I think is awesome and perhaps was the reason why Dreadnoughtus was chosen for this scene. After a brutal fight, the older male is defeated and is presumed to have died from his injuries and from exposure to the sun as all the other Dreadnoughtus leave the desert. This scene is awesome, plain and simple. The second scene takes us to Central Asia. Now, this is where we'll be spending the majority of this episode as the next three scenes take place in this region. Said region seems to be a vague mishmash of the Nemegd, 
Barungoyot and maybe also the Jadota formations, all of which are dated to the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. Most of the animals are from the Nemegd formation, which is known for preserving times where conditions allowed for extensive forest coverage, but also much more arid conditions. As such, we can assume this episode, as well as the second episode of season 2, Badlands, take place during a more arid period of when the sediments that would become the Nemegd formation were being laid down. The first creature we see here is an unidentified lizard only a few inches long, which I think is at least partly live acted by a modern Agamid lizard. As far as I know, no lizards have been found in the Nemegd, but Barun Goyot has several, so for the sake of labelling it, let's go with Priskagama, whose name actually means First Agama. We see it hunting insects near the carcass of what I assume is Nemegtosaurus, but I'll talk more about them later. Soaring up above are some unidentified Ashdarkids. There is a large Ashdarkid known from Nemegd, but it has not yet been named. From what little we see of them, the model appears to be near identical to that of the Quetzalcoatlus, which we'll see in the next episode. We then see a group of sleeping Tarbosaurus, whose name means alarming lizard. They are an Asian Tyrannosaur, and slightly smaller than their close relative Tyrannosaurus from North America, at roughly 34 feet long and 5 tons. They're never really the main star of any scene they're in, but they're always magnificent to look at and make their presence known. They have beautiful red coloration and patterning, as well as scarce clumps of tiny filamentous feathers. I love the way they're utilised in the stories they're featured in. Here we see that they are sleeping after feeding on the carcass. The rotting meat in and around their mouths has attracted flies. The lizards from earlier then jump around next to them to try and catch these flies. The close-ups on the Tarbosaurus really do hit home just how amazingly detailed the models are. They just look breathtaking. The lizards are in turn, however, hunted by Velociraptors. So this is the first creature that's going to be a bit more difficult to justify being present. Velociraptor, whose name means Swift Thief or Snatcher, is only known from the older Campanian stage of the Cretaceous, which lasted from 83 to 72 million years ago. But when in doubt, we refer to lead scientific consultant on the show, Dr. Darren Nash. In a Twitter thread he made, he mentions how indeterminate Velociraptorian dromaeosaurs are known from Maastrichtian Asia, which could even turn out to be specimens of Velociraptor. According to him, this is what this animal is meant to represent. Velociraptor is just a shorthand name, which also happens to be very well known amongst the public. So I think it's understandable, personally, but I can understand why some people may take issue with this. Another issue some people may have is it seemingly being portrayed as a pack hunter, despite there not being much solid evidence to support this in dromaeosaurs. Dr. Nash once again explains in the same thread that this isn't so much pack hunting, but more so being opportunistically social. Needless to say, the model looks incredible fully feathered as they should be, and of appropriate size, 6 feet long and around 15 to 20 kilograms, around the size of a turkey. Nope, I, I am not making the reference, although I think I just did. The colour scheme is a simple dark grey with yellowish tan feet, a very bird-like colour scheme, and I really like it honestly. One of the raptors accidentally awakens the tarbosaurs, who then scare the raptors off. The shot of the Tarbosaurus in front of the sunset is just beautiful. Genuinely takes my breath away. After they leave, the Ashdarkids then descend to feed on the carcass, with a cool shot from within the carcass. In the third scene, we are introduced to Mononychus. It is a type of Alvaresaur, a group of theropods that evolved to only have a single large claw on their forelimbs. The name Mononychus even means single claw. Arguably the cutest animal in the show, it is only 3 feet long and around 3 kilograms. The barn owl-like face is no accident. 
The skull bones of alvarosaurs show adaptations to having hearing comparable to modern owls and likely had the accompanying facial discs that are shaped to direct sound waves towards the ears. Speaking of the feathers, the body is appropriately covered and I appreciate that the narration states that their bare legs help to keep them cool whilst their feathers protect the skin from the sun's UV rays. I love the barn owl coloration too, the dark red beak to boot. Here we see a female Mononychus use her superb hearing to locate a hollow log, to which she then uses her giant claws to break inside, finding a termite nest. We then see a third special quirk of this charming dinosaur, a long flexible tongue, much like an anteater. Perhaps the more raggedy look the tail has was done to resemble that of a giant anteater. I think the creators knew how cute and charming this dinosaur was, as they give it some moments of comedy too, like when she gets termites all over her face. I just… how can you not love this? The area is then struck by a rare desert storm to which the Mononychus runs for shelter in a cave and her wet feathers are amazingly well done. We then have a cool time lapse sequence of dormant seeds in the earth sprouting and providing food for several animals such as insects. Among these animals are a flock of Mongolian Enantiornifs. The only named genus of this group from Nemegd is Gurulinia, so let's label them as such. Anantiornifs were the most successful group of birds of the Mesozoic. They differed from modern birds, the Euornifs, in two key ways. One is that almost all of them retained teeth in their beaks. The second is the structure of their shoulders. In birds, the shoulder is formed by two bones, the scapula and the coracoid, both of which are connected by the tips where one is concave and the other is convex. In modern birds, the scapula joint is convex and the coracoids is concave. In enantiornifs, it is the opposite condition where the scapula joint is concave and the coracoids is convex. This feature is what lends the group their name, opposite birds. It's hard to comment on them as they're only on screen for a few seconds, but it's cool they were name dropped. The Mononychus attempts to catch them despite them being much too large for it to eat. We then see her essentially suffer sensory overload after being overwhelmed by so many new sounds all at once. The narration then states how this new growth won't last for long and the searing heat and sand will soon return. In the fourth scene, the narration explains how deserts are not only formed by searing heat but also violent winds. As such, we see an awesome shot of a large dust devil behind a herd of the Hadrosaur Bars Baldia. Its name refers to the prolific Mongolian paleontologist Rinchen Barsbold. It was a huge hadrosaur, measuring around 33 feet long, but may have grown even larger and weighed around 5 tons. They have a very naturalistic earthy brown colour with subtle striping on their backs. Barsboldia is a sorolophy, hadrosaurs that mostly lack the elaborate hollow head crest of their cousins, the Lambiosaurines like Allura Titan, who we'll talk about in the episode Ice Worlds. You'll notice how most of the Sorolophene hadrosaurs will look almost identical to Barsboldia. It's not a critique per se, as these animals were very similar in appearance, and credit where it's due, they do give them all distinct colorations and markings to differentiate them. Barsboldia's classification as a Sorolophene has been questioned, however, as the skull is unknown and some of the postcranial skeleton resemble those of Lambiosaurines, but the most recent studies of the animal claims that it is a Sorolophene, so I have no issues with this reconstruction. The narration states that they are long distance specialists, which, whilst we don't know if this was the case for Barsboldia specifically, there was a study on hadrosaur leg bones that showed that they were the group of dinosaurs best adapted for long distance. So I'd say, considering the arid environment they lived in, it's quite a reasonable conclusion. We see the hadrosaurs reach a desert oasis and it is just jaw dropping. The sheer number of animals on display in this scene is incredible. We have Barsboldia, Mononychus, Living Nemectosaurus and Ashdarkids. So that's four, but it doesn't stop there though 
as we are then introduced to a unique sauropod, the Mongolian Titan, as Sir David calls it, which is actually based on a giant footprint, far exceeding any of the other known sauropods in the Nemegd formation. The narration states that they weigh 70 tons, which I guess is reasonable? It's hard to say when all we have to go off is a footprint. Whilst it's a bit difficult to make out, they do actually have quite a vibrant colour scheme on their heads, with shades of light brown and cyan. Much like the Dreadnoughtus from earlier, they are some of the largest animals to have walked the earth and are accompanied by Enantiornifs, bringing us up to six species. There are two dinosaurs present which only make cameos before having bigger appearances in future episodes. These are Therizinosaurus, who we'll talk about more in Forests, and Tarchia, likewise in Badlands, so that's eight. All of these animals, however, are then joined by a Tarbosaurus, which caps us off at an impressive nine different species. The shot of it calmly appearing over the crest of a distant sand dune is wonderful, and once again, Prehistoric Planet is excellent at subverting expectations, as he is only here to drink. As such, the herbivores don't panic, as the predator has made its presence known and conveyed that it is not hunting. As such, the herbivores grant him a wide berth and they all drink in peace. An amazing detail is that if you look closely, all of the different dinosaurs display different methods of drinking. Eventually, all of the water in the oasis dries up and the animals disperse. This scene feels genuinely magical to me. Arguably the best scene of the entire show, honestly. Just incredibly beautiful and very reminiscent of Disney's dinosaur, actually. In the fifth scene, we are taken to a new location. Well, ish. This is the first instance of the show reusing creatures from previous episodes. Some people have criticized the show for this, as they see it as recycling content. I personally don't have an issue with it, as long as it is done well and feels justified. This scene is a great example of this, as we are reintroduced to Barbarodactylus from Coasts. Here though, they are the sole focus, and the scene takes place on the headlands of various buttes and plateaus in a wind-eroded desert, presumably in North Africa, safe from predators. This is another visually stunning scene, as is the case with this entire episode, honestly. Much like the last scene, we see a crazy amount of animals on screen, with hundreds of males flying overhead. Here we get a better look at these pterosaurs. They are coloured a mix of brown and grey, with the males having splashes of red on them. As such, we have strong sexual dimorphism here, with females having much smaller crests and also being considerably smaller overall. We see two males have a dogfight, resulting in a pretty brutal crash landing and death for one of them. We're then introduced to a sneaky male, a male that does not develop the giant crests like other males, and instead looks more like a female, albeit still with his red male colouring. This is a natural phenomenon that occurs in several modern animals, such as red deer, where males will avoid more dominant males to mate with females, usually in harem scenarios. It's a genuinely fascinating behaviour, and I applaud the team for including it here. One of the dominant males on patrol spots the sneak, but then attempts to woo him, thinking he's a female. The sneak rejects his advances and then goes on to impress a female, it is a good question if females do actually prefer sneaky males, as it would presumably take intelligence and ingenuity to bypass intimidating dominant males. A great and interesting scene overall. The sixth and final scene fittingly takes us back to South America, essentially bookending the episode in Argentina. This time, however, we are in the Lago Colhuehuapi formation. I really hope I pronounced that correctly. This formation documents rapid change geologically from that of a floodplain with plentiful rivers to that of incredibly arid gypsum deserts. The narration does explain how every decade or so, this area dries to a point where almost all vegetation dies. 
In this unique desert environment, we are introduced to another hadrosaur, Cicernosaurus. Whilst most hadrosaurs are known from the northern continent, comprising the ancient landmass Laurasia, Cicernosaurus is thought to be descended from a lineage that crossed a temporary land bridge between the Americas. Whilst it wasn't the first known, Cicernosaurus was the first hadrosaur to be named from South America. It means severed lizard, referring to how it was seemingly cut off from its relatives in the north. It was on the small side for a hadrosaur, at around 15 feet long. Like Barsboldia, it too was a Sorolophene hadrosaur, but it differs in that it was a member of the tribe Critosaurini, which are distinguished by their strange bony nasal crests. It has a really pleasing zebra stripe pattern with the crest highlighted in a striking green and yellow in some individuals. Okay, so this is some post commentary here, so sorry if the audio sounds a bit different. I'm doing this because after I'd finished recording the commentary for this video, a paper was published describing the new hadrosauroid Goncoken from southern Chile. I bring this up now as this paper also united Cicernosaurus and all other South American hadrosaurids into a new group, Ostrocritosauria, related to, but outside of, the tribe Critosaurini from North America. I will be talking about this paper again when we get to the episode Ice Worlds, with more post-commentary addenda. There are some fantastic time-lapse shots of the gypsum desert's dunes constantly moving with the winds. We then see the herd waiting until nightfall to travel, both because it's cooler and because they can use the stars as a map to find their way around the desert. Many modern animals use celestial navigation, so I think it's plausible some dinosaurs could too. During the day, we see them rest in the shade provided by a tall dune. The next day, the herd follows the sound of waves crashing thanks to their sensitive hearing. This is supported by the anatomy of hadrosaur ears, which show adaptation to picking up low frequency sounds. After scaling a giant coastal dune, the Cicernosaurus are awarded with water in the form of fog that forms droplets on their skin, and the wet scales look amazing. They discover a hidden coastal grove of plants that will sustain them for now, but eventually they will have to move on. I do wish we got to see them actually eat the plants they trekked so far for, but it's not a huge deal. So, in case it wasn't obvious by how much I've been gushing, Deserts is my personal favourite episode of Season 1. Practically every single aspect of this episode is incredible in my eyes. The visuals, the stories, and the behaviours exhibited by the animals adapted to the harsh, arid conditions of deserts. Everything here is simply breathtaking. Episode 3, Fresh Water, is certainly an interesting one. It starts out in Asia, once again in the Namegd Formation. The narration explains how the action of fresh water shapes the landscape. Here we see an example of this in the form of a canyon with a waterfall. Here we see a flock of pterosaurs resting on the canyon walls. I assume these are juveniles of the same genus seen in deserts. These are then hunted by three velociraptors, of which we can see slight colour differences between the sexes as the males have dashes of light brown. A neat touch. This scene is beautifully animated and has a really striking filming location too. Seeing all the pterosaurs panic and take off is really cool. And I love how the female raptor grabs one, but when it falls down the cliff, she jumps down after it like a snow leopard, using her feathered arms and tail as a pseudo-parachute. It's also funny seeing her leave the two males to face the wrath of an angry flock of pterosaurs. I think this scene is gorgeous to look at and really well executed, but I can't help but feel it's only loosely related to the episode's theme of fresh water. Granted, they're next to a waterfall and the canyon itself was carved by fresh water, so I suppose I can give it the benefit of the doubt. The second scene takes us to North America, where the narration explains how fresh water has fueled the growth of forests. Within these forests, we see a male Tyrannosaurus, not Hank from coasts though, sleeping next to his kill, a Triceratops. 
We'll talk more about them in the episode Forests, though, when we see them alive. I like that we see this animal covered in various injuries, including missing the tip of his tail. We then see him treat his wounds with water from a nearby river. A female T-Rex then appears, and the two show to each other that neither has interest in fighting by raising their heads and revealing their vulnerable necks. I like that we see them nuzzle, as the skin around their faces were very sensitive to touch. This is most likely referring to a paper looking into the facial structures of tyrannosaurs, which revealed that their lips and the skin on the front of their faces were indeed sensitive to touch and temperature. This was speculated as being for detecting the right temperature whilst incubating eggs, but I imagine they could also provide more comforting enrichment such as nuzzling. So, two things I feel should be said about this episode so far. One is that unless you count the pterosaurs as a different species and or the dead triceratops, we haven't had any new animals yet. Moreover, in case you haven't noticed, both scenes have only been very vaguely related to freshwater. This one especially. I don't dislike this scene per se, as I like how it shows T-Rex in a gentler light, but for one, Coast kind of already did that, and did it in a more interesting way, not to mention a more thematically appropriate way too. This leads me into my second point. Why is this in the fresh water episode? I feel like there were so many other things they could have done, like any crocodilomorphs. The Hell Creek formation in Montana, presumably where this scene takes place, even has a large crocodilomorph in the form of Thoracosaurus, which a T-Rex could have had some kind of confrontation with, maybe? It also feels too long to me, like it's padding, and takes time away from the other segments that I find much more interesting. I dunno, it's not bad or anything, but this is the first scene of the show so far I'm not crazy about. The third scene luckily picks up the slack in terms of being related to freshwater, and takes us back to the Nemegd formation in Mongolia yet again. Of the 15 scenes of the show so far, a third of them have been set in Nemegd, which is kind of crazy, and I think shows off the sheer diversity of the fauna and environment here. As such, in stark contrast to the sandy deserts in the last episode, here we see a lush swamp inhabited by a male Dinochirus. The name Dinochirus means terrible hand, as since it was named in 1970, all that was known of this animal were giant arms with huge claws. Many specimens of this dinosaur were victims of fossil poaching. After the efforts of several paleontologists reacquiring the stolen remains, in 2014, our modern view of Dinochirus could finally be assembled, and it was one of the strangest dinosaurs to ever live. In essence, it was a giant humpbacked duck, 36 feet long and weighing 6 tons, and was thought to be an omnivore, feeding on both plants and smaller animals like fish. Here it is reconstructed covered in shaggy feathers and a duck bill, trudging through the waters, scooping up water plants. This thing looks fantastic, and I feel like it's now a beloved and popular dinosaur, and I'm so glad as it's such an awesome animal. I'd say this is now the best representation of the animal on screen, with Amazing Dino World's portrayal still being wonderful and a very close second. The Dinochirus, however, is being bitten by insects, and in an attempt to rid himself of them, he rubs himself against a dead tree, scaring off what I assume are the Guri Linear birds that we also saw in deserts. It's a really fun scene, and the music really enhances the experience. Oh yeah, and it poops. Nice. The narration does explain how the Dinochirus' dung will act as fertilizer for the plants he eats, so they're not just being gross. This is a great scene, not to mention the only one that feels truly related to a freshwater environment. Like I hinted at earlier though, I feel like it's a bit on the short side, which is a shame as I'd have loved to have seen more of this environment and the Dinochirus' interactions with it. On that note, from this point on, the episode gets weird and confusing. 
So when I first watched this episode and when I started writing the script for this video, I was under the impression that the rest of this episode entirely took place in Madagascar, similar to how much of deserts took place in Mongolia. This is because the fifth scene features animals only known from Madagascar, specifically the Mavorano formation, but the narration does not specify where the last two scenes of the episode take place. For the fourth scene, it states that it is in Southern Africa, which depending on your definition, can include Madagascar. So using the knowledge that I just happen to have because I'm a paleo enthusiast, knowing that the creatures from the fifth scene lived in Madagascar, and because the narration for that scene didn't specify as such, I think it was reasonable to conclude that the fourth scene also took place in Madagascar. This idea was supported by what I assumed was a kind of context clue we'll see in the sixth scene. Regardless of whether the scene is set in Madagascar or Southern Africa, the confusion doesn't end. Why you may ask? Well, the star of this scene is Quetzalcoatlus, a giant Ashdarkid thought to have had a whopping 33 foot wingspan that is only known from North America. Now, it is reasonable to assume that flying animals as enormous as this could probably travel long distances, similar to modern albatrosses for example. But even still, Southern Africa is quite the distance from North America, even in the Maastrichtian. I don't have an issue with the long distance travel per se, but I'm more so just confused that they chose to do this at all. It just feels unnecessary to have this animal be so far removed from its known range in the fossil record, and to visit ecosystems that I imagine must surely exist there too. Speaking of said ecosystem, it again only feels vaguely related to freshwater, as there's little to no water in the scene, as it almost entirely takes place on dry land. <sighs> right, on to the actual scene. As I said before, in southern Africa, a braided river system creates isolated patches of land, protected from predators, that are ideal for pterosaurs to nest in, such as this female Quetzalcoatlus. It is named after the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl. Standing taller than a giraffe at 15 feet tall, it was arguably the largest flying animal to ever live, rivaled only by its closest Ashdarkid relatives we'll see in the episodes Forests and Islands. As to be expected, this is the best representation of the animal in media. It's perfect in every way, shape and form as far as I can tell from the model to its portrayal. Speaking of, it's nice to see an Ashdarkid portrayed as an attentive parent and not just a giant death stalk. We get an awesome time-lapse sequence of the mother building her nest and guarding it day and night. There isn't enough food on the island for her, so she has to leave her nest to feed. When she does this, however, another female discovers her nest and digs up and eats some of the eggs because Ashdarkids are contractually obligated to eat babies in some regard. The resident female returns and fights off the intruder, with only three eggs in her clutch surviving. Ignoring its confusing location and vague relation to freshwater ecosystems, honestly, I think this scene is wonderfully done. Again, I have to ask though, did this scene really need to be in the freshwater episode? In the fifth scene, we see the sediments deposited by a river forming sandbars. Even though the narration doesn't state as such, as I said earlier, this scene is set in the Mavorano formation of Madagascar. Here, live-acted amphibious crabs are preyed upon by the strange dinosaur Mashikasaurus, whose name comes from the Malagasy word Mashika, meaning vicious, making its generic name mean vicious lizard. Its specific name, Knopflerai, however, was named in honour of Mark Knopfler, who was the lead guitarist of the band Dire Straits, as the expedition crew were inspired by his music. Mashikasaurus was a small theropod, only 6 feet long and weighing 20 kilograms. It was a member of the Noasaurids, a family of strange, small theropods closely related to the ceratosaurs like Ceratosaurus and the abelosaurs like Carnotaurus, who we will see in the episode Forests. 
This is a very diverse group, as their two most complete members differ massively. Lemusaurus, from late Jurassic China, became toothless as it aged. Meanwhile, Mashikasaurus's most distinctive feature is its downward curving jaw with huge, forward protruding lower front teeth. I appreciate that the designers didn't make them look overly exaggerated, having them mostly obscured by the lips and other soft mouth tissues. The close-ups of its eye showcase how it almost has eyelash-shaped scales on its eyelids, presumably for the same purpose. I'm unsure if these are a common feature of reptiles and or birds in general, so if you know more about this than me, please do let me know in the comments. Either way, it's such amazing attention to detail. Here we see an adult female feeding on the plentiful crabs. It has a naturalistic dark brown colour and looks flawless as far as I can tell. We also see separate juvenile models, which are coloured very differently, instead having a light green palette. One of the juveniles walks off on its own chasing a crab, and because this show just hates children apparently, it is ambushed and swallowed whole by the Devil Toad, as Sir David calls it, Beelzebufo. Considering its name is a portmanteau of the demon Beelzebub and the Latin word for toad, Bufo, it's a very fitting common name. Earlier estimates measured a snout to vent length of around 16 inches, but more recent estimates are smaller at around 9 inches. It was the former record holder for the largest frog ever known, before being surpassed by an enormous frog from the Eocene of Antarctica, related to the modern helmeted bullfrog from South America. This thing looks like a real frog you could see today. Similar to Ashdarkids, it is contractually obligated to eat babies whenever it appears, be it on screen or in artwork. Much like the Dinochirus from earlier, this is another great scene, but it also feels a bit on the short side. In the sixth and final scene, we see an Ashdarkid which looks identical to the Quetzalcoatlus from earlier, which is the thing I assumed was a context clue that I mentioned earlier, connecting this scene to the fourth one giving the impression both took place in Madagascar. We also see an unnamed sauropod make a cameo, which, still under this impression, I assumed was Rapatosaurus, a titanosaur native to Madagascar. We'll see Rapatosaurus later in the Season 2 episode, Swamps, where it does actually look slightly different, lacking the dorsal spine that this dude has. But until Season 2 came out, there was no way of knowing this wasn't Rapatosaurus. All of these factors would reasonably lead you to conclude that the last three scenes all take place in Madagascar, right? At least I would have thought so. Well, according to Dr. Naish in a Twitter thread on this episode, despite the narration not stating as such, this scene actually takes place in South America of all places. Now, after some research of my own, looking at the genera and environment present in this scene, it seems that the location that best fits the bill is the Allen Formation in Argentina. It preserves a diverse range of environments ranging from arid inland areas, wetlands and estuaries. If by some chance the Ashdarkid here is not a globe-trotting Quetzalcoatlus, as far as I know, the only Ashdarkid known from Maastrichtian South America is Aero Titan, native to the Allen Formation, but it is most likely the former. As for the sauropod, as far as I can tell, it is practically identical to the Austroposeidon, which we'll see later in the episode Forests, which was known from South America, but from Brazil, not Argentina. Let's suppose it isn't Austroposeidon though, and actually represents an Argentinian genus. In this case, we're almost spoiled for choice, as there's several genera known from the Allen Formation. So let's go with... Aeolosaurus. Sure, why not? They both watch some unnamed elasmosaurs swimming in the river, visiting from a nearby estuary. I like seeing plesiosaurs venture into freshwater environments, as we have evidence of some genera doing this, with some, such as Fluvionectes from Canada, thought to even be an exclusively freshwater plesiosaur. Now, originally, I was going to criticise these unnamed plesiosaurs for being completely fabricated, 
as no plesiosaurs are known from Maastrichtian Madagascar, but with this outside info from Dr. Nash that this scene is actually in South America, as well as my previously mentioned theory of this being the Allen Formation, and them living in an estuarine environment, I am hereby labelling these elasmosaurs as the genus Kawanectes. Unfortunately, they seem to just be identical models to the Tarangisaurus from coasts. Even the striped patterning is the same. This is the first model in the show I'm genuinely kind of disappointed with, honestly. That being said, I love seeing him in the murky waters of what looks to be a coastal mangrove swamp. It's such a cool location, and I love seeing the muddy freshwater slowly mix with the blue seawater, within which fish are feeding on the plentiful organic debris. These are in turn fed on by the elasmosaurs, which spread and dissipate the cloudy brown water as they swim through it, accelerating the mixing process. This scene also feels short though, and a bit rushed too. So in case it wasn't obvious, Freshwater is definitely not my favourite episode of season 1. Of the 6 scenes, only half of them feel directly related to Freshwater, those being the scenes with the Dinochirus, Mashikasaurus and Elasmosaurus respectively, and yet, they're the ones that end up feeling too short. Instead, most of the episode's runtime is spent on the scenes that are only very loosely tied to freshwater ecosystems. Whilst I really enjoyed scenes 1 and 4 with the raptors and Quetzalcoatlus respectively, they seem like either they should have had moments evolving the actual water more, or have been moved to a different episode perhaps. I do not understand why the Quetzalcoatlus had to be in southern Africa, unless only to show their potential for global distribution. The second scene with the T-Rex is honestly just baffling to me. Not only is it the worst offender when it comes to having little to do with fresh water, the subject matter just isn't that interesting, and it drags on a bit too long, which takes time away from the more interesting scenes. The amount of hoops this episode has made me jump through to try and make sense of its second half geographically is a bit silly and one of the rare cases of an objective misstep in the show and not just a matter of opinion. I can't think of any good reason why they couldn't state in the narration where the last two scenes take place. Almost every other instance in the show where the location changes, the narration points it out. So why is this episode the exception? I say almost, as there are a few exceptions still to come, but none are as egregious as this. I do think it's cool that the episode starts with a waterfall closer to the start of a river, and ends with the river mouth where it meets the sea but this episode just felt mishandled to me in terms of writing and pacing. Long story short, I shouldn't have to do homework to make sense of my dinosaur show. With all of that said, Freshwater is still a great watch, just be aware that it's very scatterbrained and all over the place, making it one of the less good episodes of season 1 in my eyes. On that note, I think I owe an apology to episode 4, Ice Worlds. I consider this the sleeper hit of season 1 for me. In my no spoiler review of season 1 I made a year ago, I said this one was my least favourite episode and I don't really know why. Upon revisiting it, man has it grown on me. In the first scene, we see the quote unquote far north of North America. I assume this is meant to be the Prince Creek formation of Alaska, as like today, it was located within the Arctic Circle, and likely would have experienced months of polar nights where the sun wouldn't rise. As such, here we see a dromaeosaur, based on Dromaeosaurus, whose teeth have been found in Prince Creek, at the end of the long winter. As you can probably guess, it was a dromaeosaurid, whose name means running lizard, and was 6 feet long and weighed around 15 kilograms. It was much more heavily built compared to its relative Velociraptor, and it too is appropriately fully coated in feathers. The coloration is simple, but appropriate for a polar environment. 
I especially like the blue and white tips of the tail fan. I like that we see one catch and eat an insect too. It's a nice touch and shows how they were generalist hunters. As was the case for these supposed pack hunting velociraptors in deserts, the Dromaeosaurus here are shown strategically teaming up to tackle larger prey. In this case, a herd of hadrosaurs, which for some reason aren't referred to by a specific genus, but I'm sure they're meant to be Edmontosaurus. As you could have probably guessed, Edmontosaurus means Edmonton lizard, after the town of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. The specimens now referred to Edmontosaurus from Prince Creek were once referred to the genus Ugrunaluk. However, the most recent studies have concluded that they were indistinguishable from Edmontosaurus. A fantastic detail they included were the recently discovered hooves on the mummified specimen nicknamed Dakota that covered the weight-bearing digits on the hands. Some of you may have noticed that these Edmontosaurus lack the recently discovered fleshy head crest of Edmontosaurus regalis. I believe this is because the Edmontosaurus from Prince Creek are not referred to a specific species, and so may not have possessed this feature, which is assumed to be the case for the second species, E. anectens. Edmontosaurus were very large hadrosaurs, reaching lengths of around 40 feet long and weighing up to 5 tons, but they may have grown even larger. They have a really nice texture and coloration with dark grey on top and a white underbelly, also appropriate for a polar environment. What I assume are males also have dark red stripes on their necks as well as a bluish green on their faces. The juvenile models look to be more similar to their parents than some of the other juveniles we've seen so far, but this isn't really an issue, at least not to me. I appreciate that they do have very different colour schemes to the adults, with more of a dark red. Like I said back in Deserts, as a Sorolophene hadrosaur, the Edmontosaurus model looks almost identical to that of the Bars Baldia, except in terms of colour, but I don't think this is an issue. In this really photogenic polar woodland, as the hadrosaurs prepare to calmly cross a river created by spring meltwater, the dromaeosaurs spook the herd and make them panickingly cross, causing some young to be separated from their parents. We see one juvenile getting swept downstream by the strong current, and it's heartwarming to see its mother hurry over to help it get ashore. After the herd crosses the river, we see that one juvenile didn't make it, and was presumably killed either from drowning or from colliding with the rocks where its corpse ended up. The narration states that the dromaeosaurs knew this would happen from experience, which I think is very plausible. In the second scene, we head, quote unquote, downstream, where we see that a river has broadened and deposited some of its sediment, forming small, isolated islands. I love how we're only two scenes in, and this episode somehow has more to do with fresh water than half the scenes in the actual fresh water episode did. Okay, I promise I'll stop beating that dead horse. Speaking of freshwater though, unfortunately Iceworlds does similarly suffer from some confusing geography regarding this second scene, though luckily not as bad as in the previous episode. So the narration only states that this is downstream, which would imply to me that this is the same river and still meant to be in Prince Creek. This is backed up by the fact that we see an aerial shot of an Edmontosaurus herd, which I think, assuming this is the same herd we just saw, would be a reasonable conclusion. Where the confusion starts is both with the apparent lack of ice and snow, as well as the star of this scene, Ornithomimus. These islands are utilised by male Ornithomimus for constructing nests to impress the females when they arrive. Regarding the first point, this episode actually has a really neat and subtle theme of progressing through the seasons as it goes on. The first scene takes place at the end of winter and the beginning of spring, and the narration states that the Ornithomimus are partaking in a spring ritual. So this could feasibly be Prince Creek, but a few weeks or maybe even days later in spring. The narration also doesn't explicitly state that this is the same river as the first scene, but the lack of clarity and seeing an Edmontosaurus herd right next to a river like we just saw in the last scene does feel like a context clue hinting at this, at least to me. 
Where this location becomes harder to pin down is with the inhabitants. Whilst Ornithomimus isn't definitively known from Prince Creek, indeterminate Ornithomimosaurs are known from there, and Dr. Nash only refers to these as Ornithomimids in his Twitter thread detailing this episode. So maybe this is a similar situation to the quote unquote Velociraptor. We later see these creatures more definitively in Prince Creek in the season 2 episode North America, where they're shown alongside Nanooksaurus, who we'll talk about later, which is only known from Prince Creek. The most novelly occurrence of Ornithomimus definitively is further south than Prince Creek in the Horseshoe Canyon formation of Alberta, Canada, where it also lived alongside Edmontosaurus confusingly. These, however, are definitively referred to E. regalis, which have the fleshy crests these guys lack, which makes me think this isn't Horseshoe Canyon. There is another thing that confounds this whole scene's whereabouts more, but I'll explain what I mean when we get to the third scene. Casting all these geographical shenanigans aside, assuming these are indeed Ornithomimus, their name means bird mimic, and as such, they are appropriately covered in light grey feathers. Whatever these things are, I love the model. I especially love the feather mohawk and the red wingtips. They're flashy without being over the top. On the smaller side for dinosaurs, they've been estimated at around 10 feet long and weighing 170 kilograms. To the shock of probably no one, like many things in the show, these are the best ornithomimids ever put to screen. Often referred to as ostrich dinosaurs, it's a fitting title as they are very similar in build with their toothless beaks, presumed omnivorous diet, and long legs adapted for sprinting. One genus's name, Struthiomimus, even means ostrich mimic. I'm happy to see this often overlooked group get some screen time as they really are such a wonderful group of animals. Whilst we know virtually nothing about ornithomimid nesting behaviour, we know from other theropods that they would have made circular mounds and decorated them with things like twigs and stones. Here we see one male stealing twigs from another male's nest. This competitive nest building and thievery is documented in modern Gen 2 penguins who nest in rookeries and will occasionally steal from rival males who fiercely guard their nests. I think this is a really cool behaviour to portray. We then see two Edmontosaurus pass close by to the colony, whose interactions with the water as they wade through the river look amazing by the way. The Ornithomimus then raises its wings and hisses at them to try and put them off eating any of his nest. A small interaction that I really like. This is a really solid and fun scene. The music especially sells the more comedic aspect too. In the third scene, we are taken, quote, further north, as Sir David says, where we are introduced to the hadrosaur, Alora Titan. Okay, so time for more geography shenanigans, and oh boy, strap yourselves in as this one is gonna be a doozy. Like in Freshwater, unfortunately we once again have genuine poor conveyance of information to the audience about where these scenes take place. When the narration says further north, does it mean further north than we were in the previous scene? Which, depending on whether it was set in Alberta or Alaska, could vary massively, as Alaska is much closer to the North Pole. Or does it mean further north in just a general sense? I'm inclined to think it must be the latter, as this scene takes place in Russia. Many people may be given the impression that we are still in North America, as, once again, the narration does not specify. Much like in Freshwater, we again have a situation where I just happen to know that Alora Titan was discovered in Russia, but this will not be the case for everyone. I genuinely cannot fathom what the purpose of just omitting this information is, as it's needlessly confusing and kind of annoying honestly, as it would be such an easy fix. Literally all you have to say is, in the far north or northeast of Asia, as this show is allergic to naming specific countries apparently, and bam, sorted. Before I lose my mind completely obsessing over geography, let's talk about the star of this scene, Aloro Titan. 
Its name means Titanic Swan in reference to its long neck compared to most hadrosaurs. It is actually the only lambiosaurine hadrosaur in the show. This makes sense as lambiosaurines seem to have almost completely disappeared in North America by the Maastrichtian, but they remained successful in Asia for reasons unknown. Allura Titan is in fact the most completely known lambiosaurine outside of North America. It was a fairly large lambiosaurine, estimated to be around 26 feet long and weighing around 3 tons. As with all lambiosaurines, its most distinguishing feature was its hollow bony head crest, which in Allura Titan has a distinctive shape like that of the head of an axe or hatchet. The coloration isn't the most exciting, but I really love the vibrant colours on the head crests. There's something very pleasing about this model to me, and I really like it. The juveniles are also great, as they haven't yet grown their huge head crests, and just have little nubs, which is cute. Alright, and now back to the land of confusion. So, if we are continuing to assume we are, quote, further north, in the general sense, then the confusing geography persists. Just a quick heads up, there's going to be a fair amount of Russian names and terms that I'm sure I will terribly butcher the pronunciations of, so I preemptively apologise if any Russians are watching. So, the Allura Titan are heading to one of the biggest volcanic areas in the Cretaceous, the Okhotsk chukotka Volcanic Belt, which isn't name-dropped, missing another opportunity to state the scene's location, by the way. What's weird about this is that the Deccan volcanic region in India that appears in the Season 2 episode, Badlands, does get name dropped. So why not this one? The OCVB, as I'm going to refer to it from now on, was formed by the subduction of the ancient cooler tectonic plate under that of the North American plate in the region near to where the Aleutian Islands are today in the North Pacific. It would have been nice if the show explained this in some way, but I guess it's not a huge loss. It is found in two regions of eastern Russia, Khabarovsk Krai, which isn't far from the Udurchukan formation where Allura Titan was discovered, but also Chukotka, which lends the OCVB part of its name that is much further north. Now, logically, you would think, well, if Allura Titan was discovered right next to this volcanic region, it makes perfect sense that we see them there. And I agree, there's just one problem. The whole point of this scene is that the hadrosaurs are moving into this area to take advantage of the geothermally heated soil for incubating their eggs and the fertile volcanic soil fueling the growth of plants for them to eat. This is fine and completely plausible as some modern animals do so. My issue comes from the fact they're doing so under the midnight sun. This phenomenon only occurs in regions within the polar circles, and even in the Cretaceous, Allura Titan is only known from south of the Arctic Circle, which, by the way, is also further south than Prince Creek in Alaska and of roughly equal latitude to Horseshoe Canyon in Canada. So regardless of where the second scene took place, if this scene is set in or near to where Allura Titan was discovered, and the narration meant we were literally further north than we were in the previous scene, I do not know what Sir David is talking about. I feel this can't be the case though, which leaves us only one option. We are indeed further north in only a general sense and are in Chukotka, Russia, which in the Cretaceous seemed to be of roughly equal latitude to Prince Creek as far as I can tell within the Arctic Circle. Haha, <laughs> you thought you could fool me, prehistoric planet? No such luck! Now everything makes sense, right? Almost. I hope you guys are keeping up with all this. As for me, somebody called Ronald McDonald because I'm losing my f***ing mind right now. If we assume we are now in Chukotka, how did the Allura Titans get here? Well, it's entirely possible that Allura Titan had a much broader range and we just don't have evidence to prove it. One might assume they may have migrated here from their known range in the Udurchukan formation further south. It's possible, and like I said before, hadrosaurs were thought to be the group of dinosaurs best suited for long distance travel. But this is still quite the distance, so... Uh... <sighs> 
So this scene is awesome. Yeah, confusing geography and narration aside, this scene is fantastic in my opinion. As I've said, at nauseum, the Allura Titans have come to this volcanic area to capitalise on its rich, geothermally heated soils to incubate their eggs. Whilst not known for Allura Titans specifically, we know hadrosaurs nested communally and would often reuse the same nests annually. By laying them in spring, the hatchlings and adults would be able to take advantage of the summer midnight sun further accelerating the growth of nutritious plants like horsetails in the fertile volcanic soils. This is shown in a fantastic time-lapse sequence. We then see that this area's extreme productivity also provides the perfect breeding ground for blood-sucking mosquitoes. I like that we see them pose a significant threat to the hadrosaurs, especially the juveniles as it has been documented that some modern animals have died from a loss of blood from mosquito swarms. This part genuinely makes me feel itchy, especially seeing them all over the tiny hatchlings. We even see one hatchling collapse from the insects and become separated from their mother as they head to higher ground, where the stronger winds keep the mosquitoes away. Luckily, Prehistoric Planet decides to stop hating children for a moment and shows the juvenile reuniting with its mother. So yeah, despite the segment's narration being subpar in terms of being informative, by fault of the writing, and not Sir David of course, as well as being confusing geographically, again, I think it was really well executed. The filming location looks brilliant and the time-lapse sequence was wonderful. I'm also pleased we got a segment focusing on hadrosaurs, as like the ornithomimids, they too are a fantastic group that don't always get the love they deserve, simply because they're not as exciting or as cool as the carnivorous theropods for instance. The fourth scene is certainly an interesting one, contrasting with the cold vibe this episode has had for the most part. Here we see a wildfire caused by the midnight sun drying out the plentiful vegetation in a forest. Thankfully, this episode decides to stop winding me up as the narration clearly states that we are back in the north of America, and later specifies that we're in the Arctic. Granted, if you didn't know any better, you were probably unaware you had even left North America because the last scene failed to clarify that. Okay, no, I can't reopen this can of worms. Here, we see a six-foot-long, unnamed troodontid. I think this is a very justified instance of not referring to an animal by a specific genus. Firstly, there is a very large, as yet unnamed, troodontid known from Prince Creek. Secondly, if it were another genus, it would be larger than any other known genus, of which North American troodontid genera are kind of all over the place, as the group's namesake, the genus Troodon, which means wounding tooth, was a former wastebasket taxon, a taxon where specimens are placed into when they don't seem to fit anywhere else. It was only named based on isolated teeth, which by modern standards are non-diagnostic, in other words, not enough to warrant a genus name. As such, in 2017, specimens once referred to the genus Troodon were moved to different genera, one of which was Pectinodon, who we'll talk about in the Season 2 episode, North America. As for this animal, it is appropriately feathered, and I really like the large feathers on the back of the head. They remind me of those of a secretary bird. We see it foraging in the burning forest, searching for panicked animals trying to escape the flames. We then see it pick up a burning stick and use it to further spread the fire to create more opportunities to snap up any animals trying to escape. Whilst there's of course no evidence of this, modern birds of prey in Australia display this behaviour for the same reason. Considering troodontids are among the most intelligent of non-avian dinosaurs, I feel like if any non-avian dinosaurs did partake in this behaviour, they would be the most likely candidates. This method works as it flushes out a group of one of only two mammals seen in the show, and the only one of season one. Whilst going unnamed, Dr. Nash confirmed on Twitter that this animal is the genus Somolodon. 
It was a member of the extinct multituberculates, an incredibly successful group that lived from the mid-Jurassic and persisted all the way into the Oligocene, where it's thought that they were outcompeted by the unrelated but morphologically similar rodents. As such, this Somolodon looks very similar to a ground squirrel like a marmot. It's a shame we don't get to see much of it, as the model looks fantastic. This scene is extremely short, but I feel like it's not a bad thing. I suppose it would have been nice to see more of the Somolodon before they get flushed out by the flames, as I'm always fond of seeing Mesozoic mammals, but I'm still pretty happy with what we got. The fifth scene is another very interesting one. For the first time in the show, we head to Antarctica. We have another stunning filming location with amazing aerial shots of a waterfall and striking autumn coloured trees. As you could probably guess, this scene takes place in autumn and focuses on the Ankylosaur Antarctopelta, the first dinosaur ever discovered from the now frozen continent. Antarctopelta, whose name means Antarctic Shield, is known from the Snow Hill Island formation in the Antarctic Peninsula. It is one of the very rare cases of a prehistoric planet model already being outdated. Antarctopelta is known only from very incomplete remains, so any reconstruction would be highly speculative at best. As such, it was reconstructed as a kind of generic nodosaurid, a family within Ankylosauria. During production, however, a paper was published naming and describing the genus Stegoros from the late Cretaceous of Argentina. It was much more complete and had a very distinct tail club that reminded its describers of the Aztec weapon Macuahuitl. It was then found to share many similarities with the known elements of Antarctopelta and is thought to be its closest relative, along with Cunbarosaurus from Australia forming a group of ankylosaurs only known from the southern hemisphere, the parankylosaurs. Using bracketing, it now makes the most sense to reconstruct Antarctopelta based mostly on Stegoros. The latter genus is very small for an ankylosaur, with an adult size of only 6 feet long and around 2 feet tall. All known elements of Antarctopelta that overlap with those known from Stegoros are larger with estimates for Antarctopelta being around 13 feet long and 4 feet tall. The unfortunately outdated model still looks great though, of which we only see juveniles, so judging accuracy was going to be difficult no matter which reconstruction we go off of. The lighting of this scene is fantastic, seeing all the different shadows cast on the Antarctopelta through this temperate Antarctic forest canopy looks wonderful. The star of this scene is one of three young brothers whom we see attempt to huddle in a small burrow they have dug out to rest and to conserve heat to help them sit out the long winter. At first, I thought this was only speculation, but we do in fact have evidence for ankylosaurs having strong forelimbs suitable for digging, as well as young ankylosaurs not only staying together as juveniles, but even curling up with each other to sleep, which sounds pretty adorable, I'm not going to lie. Unfortunately, they are now too large to all fit inside, and the outcast leaves to find a territory of his own. On his search, he comes across a very peculiar animal indeed, as yet unnamed Antarctic hadrosaurs. Some of you may not know, but we do in fact have some very scant evidence of hadrosaurs in Antarctica in the form of isolated teeth. They're not much, but they are just enough to prove that at least at one point in time, there were hadrosaurs in what would become Antarctica. So I don't have an issue with them being in this scene. What does kind of bother me is that they seem to just be recolored Edmontosaurus. If anything, I personally would have repurposed the Cicernosaurus model for these guys, as it, as well as most South American hadrosaurs, were members of the tribe Critosaurini. Seemingly, the only way for hadrosaurs to reach Antarctica was via South America. So it would make the most sense to me for the Antarctic hadrosaurs to most closely resemble South American forms like Cicernosaurus. Perhaps the creators know something about those fossil teeth that I don't, 
but unless proven otherwise, I feel like this would be the more logical choice. Okay, jumping in again with some more post commentary. Now, going off of what past me just said, through the power of hindsight, ironically, it is now me who knows something about those teeth that the creators couldn't have when they were producing this episode. Like I did back in Deserts, I am again referring to the paper published after I had finished recording this video, describing the hadrosauroid Goncoken from southern Chile. This discovery is heavily relevant to the validity of these supposed Antarctic hadrosaurs. As past me said earlier, these are based on teeth found in the Antarctic Peninsula. Whilst I believe my logic of them being most closely related to the South American hadrosaurids, the Ostrocritosauria, like Cicernosaurus, from a biogeographic perspective is still sound, this is assuming the Antarctic teeth are those of hadrosaurids. This paper reanalyzed these teeth and found that they actually lack any diagnostic traits exclusive to hadrosaurids, instead showing traits seen across the more inclusive group Hadrosauroidea. At the end of the Cretaceous, hadrosaurids were among the most widespread of any dinosaur group. They also appeared to outcompete many other herbivores in the environments they lived in, including the more basal hadrosauroids, which appear to go extinct when the hadrosaurids became extremely successful. The newly described genus Goncoken is significant as it was a more basal hadrosauroid, the first and only known of its kind from South America. Its closest relatives are known from around 85 million years ago in North America, such as Eotrachodon. The fact that this genus was not only living roughly 20 million years after its closest relatives died out, during the heyday of the dominant hadrosaurids, but was also on a completely different continent, suggests that these more basal animals had made the trip from North to South America earlier in the Cretaceous, before their hadrosaurid cousins did, giving them a sort of head start on colonizing the continent. This theory is supported by the fact that Goncoken was found much further south than any definitively known hadrosaurids. This, and the fact that hadrosaurids were known to outcompete many similar ornithopods, suggest that hadrosaurids may have never made it as far south as where Goncoken was found. This is also supported by the fact that Maastrichtian Antarctica also had non-hadrosaurid ornithopods, who we'll see in the episode Islands, suggesting hadrosaurids hadn't reached there either to outcompete the endemic fauna. All this to say, Hadrosaurids being present in Antarctica is not as well supported as we once thought, based on the data we now have, thanks to Goncoken's discovery. This was already tentative to begin with, as they were only known from teeth, which may actually belong to more basal hadrosauroids similar to Goncoken, which is known to have lived in southern Chile, closer to Antarctica than any definitively known hadrosaurids. Okay, now back over to Past Hodge. My nitpicks aside, I think this is a wonderful shot of the little Antarctopelta walking past this herd of much larger herbivores. It's very fitting too that they're quite literally moving in opposite directions, as the hadrosaurs are moving to warmer lands, whereas the Antarctopelta is looking for somewhere to tough out the harsh winter. Once again, I must stress how much I love the location for this scene. It is just beautiful. Eventually, the ankylosaur discovers a large cave, and just when I thought the scene couldn't get any prettier, on the roof of the cave are bioluminescent fungus gnat larvae. These are live acted, but fossils of fungus gnats are known from the Cretaceous, so this isn't just pure speculation. Even on its own, it is simply dazzling. Add dinosaurs on top, and I'm practically in heaven. The scene ends with the arrival of winter and with snow beginning to fall. Wow. Until now, I don't think I fully realised just how wonderful this scene truly is. In spite of some of the unfortunate accuracy hiccups present, neither of which the creators can really be blamed for, this scene has an almost magical quality to me. I'd go so far as to say this is my favourite part of the episode. For the sixth and final scene, we once again return to Prince Creek in the Arctic. 
Here we are introduced to Pachyrhinosaurus, meaning thick-nosed lizard. Pachyrhinosaurus is a ceratopsid in the same family as Triceratops. As its name implies, rather than having long horns, it instead has a round bony structure on its nose called a boss. Another way it differs from its more famous relative is that it's in the subfamily Centrosaurinae as opposed to Chasmosaurinae. These subfamilies differ in the size and ornamentation of their head frills. Whilst Chasmosaurines had large frills with little to no spikes, generally, Centrosaurines, like Pachyrhinosaurus, had smaller frills but more elaborate spikes protruding from them. There are three recognized species of Pachyrhinosaurus, each of which are distinguished by their frill ornamentation. The models here appropriately represent P. peritorum, the species known from Prince Creek. Size estimates for P. peritorum are around 16 feet long and weighing around 2 tons. Speaking of the models, the Pachyrhinosaurus are in my opinion one of the best looking creatures in the whole show. The amount of detail in their colour palettes you can see in the close-ups is insane. These things just look amazing in every shot they're in. Accuracy wise, these guys provide an interesting discussion. This is concerning feathers. Here they are reconstructed with quill-like filamentous feathers. Whilst quill-like feathers are known in the much more basal ceratopsian Cetacosaurus from early Cretaceous Asia, they are not known in derived ceratopsids like Pachyrhinosaurus. This isn't to say they didn't have them though, so honestly, it doesn't bother me. Here we see a herd in a polar woodland led by a dominant bull, struggling to find food under a thick coating of snow in winter. We see that the bull has a large gash on his side as the narration states that the scarcity of food makes it harder for animals to replenish their energy and therefore for injuries to heal, foreshadowing for later. We then get a pretty foreboding introduction to Nanooksaurus. Seeing the Pachyrhinosaurs panickedly looking around upon hearing throaty calls from nearby echoing through the forest before actually seeing them. Nanooksaurus, whose name comes from the indigenous Alaskan word for polar bear, making its name polar bear lizard, was a type of Tyrannosaurid that had alternately been referred to the genera Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus until it was given its own genus in 2014. Both the size and integument of this animal are up for debate. As Nanooksaurus is only known from skull elements, it is difficult to determine the total length of the animal. The best method for estimating the total length was to compare the known elements to other, more complete Tyrannosaurids and measure them relative to the total body length. At first, it was found to be much smaller than other Tyrannosaurids at around 20 feet long, only half the size of Tyrannosaurus. But more recent studies state that these elements represent an individual that was not fully grown, and that undescribed adult teeth are comparable in size to those of other Tyrannosaurids. With this in mind, Estimates for Nanooksaurus total length now vary from 23 to 30 feet long and weighing around 1 to 2 tons. Here they are portrayed as around 23 feet long, which is a lower estimate for an adult, but Dr. Nace states that these may represent sub-adult animals. As for their integument, here they are portrayed with a thick coat of feathers. In a strange parallel to the Ceratopsians, whilst this isn't conclusively known for derived Tyrannosaurids, the more basal Tyrannosaur, Eutyrannus, from early Cretaceous China, is known to have been fully covered in feathers and is thought to have lived in a warmer climate than Nanooksaurus. I personally find reconstructing Nanooksaurus with a full feather coat to be very reasonable considering the cold climate it lived in. So, unless proven otherwise, I have no issues here. We see three individuals stalk the Pachyrhinosaur herd, I like that we see the herd strategically moving out of the trees upon spotting the predators and into more open space to better stand together, as well as to reduce the chances of some becoming separated for the predators to pick off. Out in the open, we see the Pachyrhinosaurs take on what is a popular trope in paleomedia, 
where adult ceratopsids in a herd will form a protective circle around the young when threatened, much like modern musk oxen. There's no evidence of this, but if it works for musk oxen against wolves, I don't see why it wouldn't work with ceratopsids against tyrannosaurs. Both parties, however, end up caught out in a blizzard and cease their conflict until the weather clears. I really appreciate moments like this where they just stop because they're animals and not movie monsters. I love how the narration describes this as a temporary truce to, it essentially is, as it is in both parties' best interest to wait until they can both see clearly again. Once the blizzard passes, we see some amazing snow effects as the nanooksaurs shake off the snow they were covered in by the wind. Unfortunately for the pachyrhinosaurs, one or more herd members lose their nerve and run, spurring the others to follow suit. The nanooksaurs give chase, and as was foreshadowed earlier, one exhausted male is slower than the others and is left behind to face the three nanooksaurs alone. Weirdly, this doesn't seem to be the injured bull we saw earlier, as it has no visible injury on its leg. Maybe it is supposed to be, but the CG artist forgot? I don't know. It's a little weird whatever the case is. I feel like the pacing of this scene could have used a bit of tweaking, as the ending also feels a bit abrupt to me. It feels like the nanooksaurs take the bull down very quickly, and then it cuts to it just being dead. Maybe if they trimmed down the part where they formed the protective circle, and then extended this part a little more, I'm nitpicking a lot here, and it's a little bit of a shame that the scene doesn't quite stick the landing, but it was still great nonetheless. So my closing thoughts are that I've really come around on Ice Worlds, like quite a bit. I know there are some issues with the narration and also the pacing at times, but these were nowhere near as bad as in Freshwater. Speaking of, it was nice that this episode was always themed around polar regions, Okay, yeah, the third scene is a bit funky geographically, but again, not as egregious as Freshwater. I really like the subtle progression through the seasons this episode has too. I'm kind of shocked I used to consider this the weakest episode of season one. I don't know what I was thinking in hindsight. Whilst not on par with coasts or deserts in my opinion, I'd say I'd rank Ice Worlds as third best overall. Episode 5, Forests, is the last episode of Season 1 and is unique in that it's the only episode with 7 scenes, the most of any episode. In the first scene, we are taken to South America, specifically the Presidente Prudente Formation in Brazil. We get some really nice aerial shots of the canopy. I'm not a tree expert, so I'm not sure what species are present or how likely they were to be present in this time and place. So if any of you know better than me, please do let me know in the comments. Here we see some trees being felled by a herd of the Titanosaur, Ostro Poseidon. Its name means Southern Poseidon after the Greek god of the same name. If being more specific, the name can mean Southern God of Earthquakes, which sounds so cool. Whilst only known from a few vertebrae, these are thought to be the largest dinosaurs known from Brazil. Estimated at around 80 feet long, standing around 20 feet tall, from comparisons with other titanosaurs of similar sizes. The model looks good and as accurate as it probably can be, but the coloration just feels really bland. It's just brown, with little to no patterning. Not the biggest fan of this one. I find the music for this scene sounds similar to the Jurassic World soundtrack. Is that just me? We see some unidentified Enantiornifs flee the branches of a tree before the sauropod pushes it over. No opposite wing birds are known to have lived alongside Ostro Poseidon. The only Enantiornith material known from Brazil are not referred to a specific genus. Plus, they're only on screen for like two seconds, if that. So, eh. The scene then ends by showing a time-lapse sequence of plants competitively rushing to claim the newly made space where the felled tree once stood for the best exposure to sunlight. Whilst I appreciate the scene for showcasing this crucial aspect of forest ecosystems, 
This scene feels really random. It's incredibly short and simple, and as far as I can tell, no plant fossils are known from the Presidente Prudente formation. So I'm honestly really confused why they chose this location of all places. Fossilized wood from yew trees are known from the Allen Formation of Argentina, for example, which has several genera of large titanosaurs. Weirdly, the unidentified titanosaur from freshwater that uses the Austroposeidon model that I suggested could be Aeolosaurus is one of these genera, and would therefore have been a pretty ideal candidate if they really wanted a large South American titanosaur for this scene. It's incredibly short, and the most interesting thing that happens is the plant time-lapse sequence, which has nothing to do with the dinosaurs, which are themselves some of the more boring looking ones in the show. Not crazy about this scene to be honest. The second scene is thankfully much better and more impressive in my opinion. We now move to North America, where we see a herd of Triceratops. As I'm sure many of you already know, as it's one of the most famous dinosaurs, Triceratops means three-horned face and was a large chasmosaurine ceratopsid at around 26 feet long and weighing around 8 tons. Much like its fellow ceratopsid Pachyrhinosaurus, the Triceratops has one of the most impressive models of the entire show. I'm almost inclined to say models plural as the amount of individual variation here is insane. I believe these represent the species T. horridus as opposed to T. prorsus due to the more angular head frill, smaller nose horn and longer brow horns. Speaking of, the sheer variety of brow horn shapes and sizes on display here is amazing. This one herd has animals ranging from relatively straight horns to completely upwards curving horns and tons of intermediate forms between these two extremes. Practically every animal has its own distinct shape. The skin texture and coloration are also both so detailed. Both ceratopsids in this show look amazing. Not only do we get fantastic adults, we get an accurate and adorable juvenile model. We know from juvenile specimens that young Triceratops had much shorter frills and horns which pointed upwards. As they grew, their horns would straighten and be used mainly for competing against rivals in the males, but also to deter potential predators. Triceratops also shares the distinction with Tyrannosaurus of appearing in the most episodes at 4. Granted, one of those appearances for Triceratops was only as a corpse in freshwater, but I think it still counts. Another way it's similar to T-Rex is that like in its first appearance, they actually made Triceratops interesting too. Here we see, perhaps for the first time ever on screen, dinosaurs heading into a cave to find a clay lick to counteract the plant toxins in their stomachs. Something I think this show does amazingly well is having unique and interesting filming locations. Every single one has felt distinct, and I think Forest is the episode that impresses me the most in this regard, as I feel it, or the season 2 episode, Oceans has the hardest job to do in terms of making their locations interesting. It does a fantastic job of making every scene look like more than just trees. This scene is a perfect example of this, as whilst we are still in a forest, the herd has to travel through a cave to get to their clay antidote. Some modern animals are known to do this for similar reasons, so I think it's entirely plausible Triceratops and other herbivorous dinosaurs partook in this behaviour from time to time. Considering Triceratops is known from locations close to what, at the time, were the newly forming Rocky Mountains, I'm sure there must have been caves near where they lived. Speaking of its range, let's just say we're in the Hell Creek Formation. We get a really cool and unique night vision sequence whilst they're in total darkness in the cave. How the adults don't stab each other accidentally in this part, I have no idea. We see one juvenile struggling to traverse the cave amidst the huge adults in such close quarters. 
Eventually, the majority of the herd makes it to the clay at the end of the cave, and we see them scrape it off the walls of the cave with their beaks to then swallow it. The prehistoric planet gods then smile upon us as the juvenile Triceratops survives and makes it out of the cave and is reunited with its mother. I think this scene is fantastic, but again it feels a bit short. I do think having seven scenes puts this episode's pacing at a disadvantage compared to the others, as the scenes tend to not feel as fleshed out as those of some of the other episodes. Honestly, I wouldn't have minded if they cut the Austro-Poseidon scene entirely, and instead showed more of the Triceratops herd before they entered the cave, seeing them actually feeding on the toxic plants that they now need the clay for. Even still, I loved what we did get here. The third scene is definitely a fan favourite, and considered a highlight of not only season 1, but of the entire show. We once again head back to South America, this time though the narration specifies that it's Patagonia. We're getting closer to naming actual countries, go on Sir David, I believe in you! We are in the La Colonia Formation in Argentina, where we see a strange, unnatural clearing in a dense forest. This is the work of a male Carnotaurus, another very popular dinosaur, shown partaking in more unique behaviour, and I love it. Carnotaurus means meat-eating bull, in reference to the distinct cattle-like horns above its eyes. It is known from only one specimen, but it is almost complete and is measured at around 25 feet long and weighing around 2 tons. It was an abelisaur, a group of theropods that were incredibly successful in the southern hemisphere, famous for their tiny, backwards pointing arms that seemed to be functionally useless. More on that later. I love the model especially the male, but I might be biased as orange is my favourite colour. It is appropriately leggy with a beefy tail base, housing giant chordofemoral muscles to grant it incredible bursts of speed. It is also reconstructed without feathers, as we have skin impressions of this animal that show it had scaly skin. As you probably guessed, this is also the best Carnotaurus ever put to screen. The male has made this clearing to essentially act as a dance floor. He then uses low frequency growls to signal to any potential females nearby that he is ready to perform. He eventually attracts a larger female, who is coloured more of a grey, and they do a really good job of showing she is older with more weathered skin and horns. He then puts on a show for her, with some spins and tail waggles. The real kicker, however, is when he starts waggling his supposedly useless arms, revealing a vibrant blue colour. Whilst there's of course no proof Carnotaurus actually did this, the arm sockets are indeed ball and socket joints and would have allowed for this kind of rotation. This theory has been thrown around for a few years, and honestly, I love this so much that I am on board. The music also really sells this scene, it's just great. His finishing pose has him raise his head, exposing his vulnerable neck to the female as she gets close to him. Unfortunately for the male, she's not impressed. I don't know what her problem is honestly, if I saw that I'd be pretty swept off my feet. Do I even need to explain why this scene is so beloved? It is again, very short, but this one feels like the right length. It's so silly and fun, and again, I'm always happy to see popular dinosaurs doing more unusual things. It's just great stuff all around. The fourth scene is another that I'm very fond of. Once again, I applaud the choice of filming location for keeping the forest backgrounds interesting. Here we are taken to a beautiful autumnal forest in East Asia, specifically the Nanchong Formation in Guangdong, China. It makes me so happy seeing dinosaurs surrounded by autumn coloured leaves, as I feel they're almost always surrounded by healthy green vegetation. A tree even gets name dropped, the Ginkgo. These are incredibly ancient trees that have been around since the Permian period around 280 million years ago, and are still around today in the form of only one species. Ginkgo biloba. 
we see the fruit of these trees being eaten by a flock of Carithoraptor. Their name means helmeted thief slash snatcher due to their tall head crest resembling Corinthian helmets. They are a type of oviraptorosaur, very bird-like theropods that were very successful in the Cretaceous, especially in Asia. These are known to have been fully coated in feathers from amazingly preserved fossils. They are presumed to have been mostly herbivorous, but some members of this group may have had more of a taste for meat. Corythoraptor was roughly 5 feet long and around 30 kilograms. I am in love with this model. The beautiful blue plumage looks amazing, especially contrasted against the warmer autumn colours around it. I once again must applaud this episode for not only showcasing old favourites like Triceratops and Carnotaurus, but also for showing off more obscure species like these. Speaking of, we then see the foraging Carithoraptors being stalked by Chanchausaurus. This is the fourth and final Tyrannosaur in the show, and it might just be my favourite of the lot. It is named after Chanchao, the older name of the Chinese city Ganzhou. Length estimates range from 23 to over 30 feet long, as the genus is only known from a single subadult specimen. It was nicknamed Pinocchio Rex when it was discovered, as it has a distinctly long and narrow snout compared to most other tyrannosaurs. I love this model too. It has a really naturalistic dark brown coloration with very subtle tan stripes down its sides. The filaments on its back look wonderful too. It is animated so beautifully when it's stealthily stalking the Carithoraptors. It then does an impression of the polar allosaur from walking with dinosaurs as it steps on a branch, alerting its prey. The panicked Carithoraptors flee and make just the best noise maybe ever. The Tyrannosaur's hunt fails. A storm hits the area and the predator tries again, now better camouflaged in the gloomier lighting and harder to hear over the rustling of leaves and branches in the wind. The predator successfully catches a Carithoraptor, and I love how we see it essentially tackle its prey to the ground and then slide across the forest floor from the built-up momentum. The fifth scene, much like in Ice World, showcases a forest fire in North America. Unlike Ice Worlds, however, I'm pretty certain this is meant to take place in the Horseshoe Canyon formation of Alberta, Canada. We see an Edmontosaurus mother fleeing the flames with her young, and this is the first time they actually get name dropped. Weirdly though, this may have been arguably the worst time to name drop them, as the species known from Horseshoe Canyon was Eregalis, the species thought to possess a fleshy head comb which this model lacks. It's not a huge deal though, really, just odd. A wonderful detail I only just noticed upon reviewing this scene is how the mother appears to slip slightly on a rock in this shot. It's such a small touch, but it's great. This scene differs from the forest fire scene in Ice World in that it instead focuses on events after the fire has burned out. The narration then explains how, despite how it may appear, this is actually exactly what some plants need in order to reproduce. This is true in some modern plants, sometimes referred to as pyroclimax species. I love that they included this, as it helps differentiate it to the aforementioned scene in Ice Worlds. It also shows beetles now laying their eggs as their young will hatch and be able to feed on the plentiful dead wood. Said beetles, however, are then fed upon by an Atrociraptor. Its name means Savage Thief or Snatcher, and it was a type of Dromaeosaur. It is only known from the skull of a single specimen, which had a distinctly short but tall snout, which is reflected in this reconstruction. It is estimated to have been around 6 feet long and weigh about 15 kilograms. It looks like they've also given it especially large sickle claws, which, unless we find more remains of this animal, we won't know for sure if this is accurate. I think it's still very plausible a Trociraptor had proportionally large sickle claws though. I'd say this is probably my least favourite of the Dromaeosaurs in the show so far. 
The colours aren't that interesting and something about it just doesn't speak to me the way the others do. It's not bad, far from it, just personal preference. We then see it pick up a smoking twig and use it as an insecticide to kill any potential pests from under its wings. This behaviour has been documented in modern birds, so I'd say it's within the realm of possibility for a dromaeosaur like a trociraptor to partake in this activity too. We are then introduced to a very peculiar creature indeed. The atrociraptor is scared off by an ankylosaur, which for some reason isn't referred to by a specific genus, but it is meant to be Anodontosaurus, based on its distinctly wide and pointed tail club. Despite possessing teeth, its name means toothless lizard, as compression damage to the fossil had removed the teeth from the skull. It was an average sized ankylosaurid, measuring around 16 feet long and weighing 2 tons. The model looks amazing and I adore the bluish green colour scheme it has. I'm just baffled by the fact that you barely get to see it. It forages in the burnt forest and eats some charcoal, which the narration states will bind with the plant toxins in its stomach and neutralise them. Much like the Triceratops from earlier, modern animals are known to do this too for similar reasons. After this though, this beautiful model is just… gone. Instead, we see more of the Edmontosaurus as they leave the forest, which already had plenty of screen time in the last episode. What's baffling still is that the Anodontosaurus wasn't reused at all for season 2. I think this scene is good, but certain things about it rub me the wrong way. Whilst I quite like the stuff with Atrociraptor and showing the aftermath of the fire, I wish the focus of the scene had more emphasis on the Anodontosaurus rather than the Edmontosaurus as not only have we seen them before, they feel like they pinch screen time from a brand new animal and are acting like padding. Not super fond of this part on the whole. The sixth scene starts in a really interesting manner, as the narration states that when trees die, they become food for fungi. As such, we see a time-lapse sequence of various types of fungi growing and bioluminescing in the night. The narration speculating that this is done to attract insects who then help spread their spores. I'm glad they included this, as fungi are vital parts of forest ecosystems. This scene is in Central Asia, and once again, specifically in the Nemegd formation of Mongolia. Here we see a sleeping sauropod, whose snores are apparently amplified by their air sacs. I don't know if there's any truth to this, but I love it. This guy is never named, and at first I thought it was Nemectosaurus, but upon closer inspection, it appears to, again, just be the Austroposeidon model, as made evidence by the dorsal spines. So if it's a sauropod from the Nemect formation that isn't Nemectosaurus or the Mongolian Titan, then that leaves Opistho Coelacordia, at least in terms of name genera, which is a mouthful of a name and a pain to spell. Why did you name it this? The actual stars of this scene are a trio of juvenile Therizinosaurus, who we first saw in a cameo back in deserts. Therizinosaurus means scythe lizard, named after its meter long claws on its hands, the largest claws in the animal kingdom. These claws were so huge that they were originally thought to be the ribs of a giant turtle, which owes it its specific name Chiloniformis, meaning turtle form. Therizinosaurs are one of the strangest groups of dinosaurs to ever live, as they were herbivorous theropods with enormous claws that are thought to have been used for both manipulating plants as well as for defence against predators. Both juveniles and adults are covered entirely in feathers, which has been a matter of debate, as animals this large may not have needed extensive feather coverage as it may have posed a risk of overheating. Personally, I don't take issue with this portrayal, but this may change in the future. An adult Therizinosaurus was enormous, estimated to reach lengths of around 30 feet and weighing around 5 tons. These three juveniles, however, are only about 3 feet long. As such, the narration explains that they move around at night as it is safer from predators. It's hard to make out because of the lighting, or I guess lack thereof, but the three are in fact different colours. 
here we see the trio come across honey from a bee's nest. Bees are known from the late Cretaceous. Whether they were colonial, eusocial, or produced honey like modern honeybees is unknown. However, I think it's plausible that they were around though. Plus, it gives us this cute scene. We see the trio attempt to climb a log to reach the hive, which according to Dr. Nash, is a reference to a theory in the 1990s that Therizinosaurs were tree climbers that fed on social insects. This theory has long since been put to bed though. It is very cute and funny seeing them try and climb this log though. The juveniles are then swarmed by the insects, receiving many stings in the process. We then see an adult Therizinosaurus. It's a really cool reveal, and I love how the juveniles just look at it in awe for a second before it smacks down the bee nest and eats some of the honey, completely undeterred by their stings. We then see the juveniles lick up the leftovers, whilst being stung by some understandably angry bees. There isn't a lot to this scene, but it's so wholesome and fun, and the reveal of the adult was genuinely really cool. It's also very short though, as are most of the scenes in this episode. The seventh and final scene is where I feel the rushed pacing of this episode is felt the worst. We now head to Europe, specifically Romania in the San Petru Formation. This was once an island in the Tethys Sea called Hatseg Island after the town of Hatseg in Romania. This was an island where the fauna underwent the natural phenomenon of insular dwarfism. This is caused when animals are isolated in a smaller geographic area, be it by ocean or altitude, where, due to the lack of resources compared to larger land masses, shrink over time to avoid using up the fewer resources. As such, Hatseg Island was home to several dwarf dinosaurs, smaller than their relatives on the mainland. Like I hinted at earlier, this scene feels the most rushed and overpacked for how much time is left in the episode. I hope you guys are ready for a kind of rapid fire of creatures back to back. Okay, here we go. The first of these is the dwarf hadrosaur Telmatosaurus. Its name means marsh lizard, and it was about 16 feet long, much smaller than its more derived mainland hadrosaurid cousins, such as Edmontosaurus. The model looks fantastic, and I love the dark red coloration. It's truly a shame that we barely get to see it. Up next we meet some juvenile Zalmoxes. It is named after Zalmoxis, a deity in the religion of the ancient peoples of Romania. Adults were thought to be around 8 feet long. It was a member of the Rhabdodontids, a group only known from Europe, whose origins may lie somewhere in the early Cretaceous, and whose closest relative may in fact be Mutaburosaurus from Australia of all things. Okay, jumping in with more post-commentary. Apparently the universe wanted to punish me for making this video, as not just one, but two papers were published describing new dinosaur genera relevant to this video after I had finished recording. This second paper named and described the genus Iani from the Cedar Mountain Formation of Utah, dated to around 100 million years ago. This animal was referred to the group Rhabdodontomorpha, a group including the Rhabdodontids, like Zalmoxes, as well as the genera Mutaburosaurus and Fostoria from Australia, and maybe even Iani's North American contemporary, Tenontosaurus. This new research expands the geographic range of this group to North America, suggesting that if they were much more widespread than we previously thought, this may lend support for the grouping of European genera with those from Australia. If this grouping is indeed valid, it's plausible to think there could be other, similar genera waiting to be discovered on other land masses, particularly those that once comprised Gondwana, as they would nicely bridge the gap between those in Laurasia and those in Australia. But this is purely speculation. Okay, back to past Hodge. The Rhabdodontids also includes Moclodon, which was very similar to, and even smaller than, Zalmoxes, but also Rhabdodon itself, which was considerably larger. Whilst it was long thought that Zalmoxes and Moclodon represented island dwarves, the most recent study has actually concluded that this small size was the ancestral condition for Rhabdodontids, 
and that Rabdodon actually experienced gigantism on the mainland. I love the model, and purple coloration especially, one of the most crisply detailed models in the show when it comes to the scales. It is wonderful, and I'm glad we at least get to see a bit more of them in Season 2. We see a group of young Zalmoxies crossing a fallen log. Most of the troop makes it, but just when we thought we were doing alright in terms of infant mortality, the last one is devoured by the giant Ashdarkid, Hatsigopteryx. I hate this thing. I pretty much have since I first found out about it when I first watched Planet Dinosaur back in 2011. When I say I hate it, I mean it in the best way, as it's always creeped me out. Prehistoric Planet fully capitalises on this creepy factor in its second appearance in Ireland. Here it's more unsettling, I guess? Its name means Hatseg Wing, and it is of comparable size to its relative Quetzalcoatlus. Likewise, standing 15 feet tall with an estimated wingspan of 36 feet. Being able to fly between the giant island chain of southern Europe at this time, they are the top predators. The design is fantastic, as is its portrayal as a terrestrial carnivore. Doesn't make me like the creature, but my personal biases aside, it is excellent. We see him make his way out onto the beach, where we also see a group of both Talmatosaurus and presumably some adult Zalmoxes feeding on the sea sprayed plants on the beach as they are a good source of salt. This behaviour seems perfectly plausible to me. We then meet the final creature of Season 1, yet another unnamed sauropod. Luckily this one has been confirmed by Dr. Nash on Twitter to be either the genus Paludi Titan or another as yet unnamed genus. I'll just stick with Paluda Titan. Its name means Marsh Titan, which is kind of oxymoronic as, due to insular dwarfism, it is one of the smallest sauropods ever found at around 20 feet long and 1 ton. I'm not too crazy about these sauropods either, as they seem to just be a mottled grey colour and not that interesting to me. We see a pair nuzzling, presumably after being unable to properly connect in the dense forest, and that's literally it. It's funny how the music in the first scene of this episode reminded me of Jurassic World, and now the music in the last scene reminds me of Jurassic Park. The Hatsigopteryx then takes off from the beach into the sky, and quite literally flies off into the sunset. The narration even states that he is flying off to another island, which very nicely transitions into the first episode of Season 2. So if I hadn't made it clear, Forests has some big problems with pacing. Seven scenes makes this episode feel like it's trying to provide quantity over quality, which is a shame as when this episode is good, it's brilliant. It's just held back by trying to squeeze too much into one episode. This is especially prevalent in the last scene where practically none of the creatures get time to do anything of much significance. I feel like the first scene with the Ostro Poseidon could be cut, and then the resulting runtime could be redistributed amongst the other scenes accordingly. The scenes with the Triceratops, Carnotaurus, Chansiosaurus, and Therizinosaurus were all wonderful. The fifth scene with the forest fire was good, but I think it could have definitely been better, such as giving the Anodontosaurus more screen time. The final scene feels so rushed that I'm kind of glad the first episode of Season 2 picks up where this one leaves off, as Hatseg Island, as well as Maastrichtian Southern Europe in general, is such a rich region in terms of interesting fauna. On the whole, I still really enjoyed forests, I just wish they'd have trimmed some parts down and fleshed others out. The first season of Prehistoric Planet is awesome in my eyes. Coast is an amazing start, showcasing the amazing and interesting pterosaurs and marine reptiles of the Mesozoic, as well as Hank the T-Rex, firmly placing it as my second favourite of the season. Deserts is just magical in every way, shape and form to me, and maybe my favourite episode of the entire show, honestly. Unfortunately for me though, this does mean it peaks with the second episode and experiences a bit of a drop off. Freshwater, while still great, feels like it was mishandled. 
The first scene is superb, but the others all felt like they had a lot of missed potential. Along with poor conveyance of information with the narration at times, it lacked a consistent theme, which I don't mind that much, it's just that the scenes not strongly relating to Freshwater just happen to drag on a bit. They end up taking up most of the runtime and making the actual freshwater based scenes less fleshed out and more lacklustre as a result. Honestly though, I actually think the high point of this episode just put it ahead of Forest. Ice World brings it back up a bit though for me, with some really interesting stories and speculation. There were some minor pacing issues with this one, which sets it below coasts for me, but I thoroughly enjoyed every scene, so it sits comfortably in third place. Forest varies a lot in quality. The majority of the scenes are superb, but the bloated number of scenes give this episode a persistent pacing problem. Try saying that three times fast. When this episode is good, it's wonderful but it's heavily weighed down by trying to do too much. In my original review of season 1, I ranked this episode 3rd overall. Upon rewatching it, I don't like it as much as I used to. Keep in mind though, that I'm ranking these episodes in their entireties, so despite how much I love certain parts of Forests, the pacing issues holds the whole thing back, where I think it actually ends up as the least good episode on the whole but I do think this is a case of it being less than the sum of its parts. So that's my ranking for the five episodes of season one. If you disagree, please do let me know in the comments and why. Without further ado, let's move on to season two of Prehistoric Planet. From Monday the 22nd to Friday the 26th of May 2023, the five episodes of Prehistoric Planet 2 were released. After the runaway success of the first season, it only made sense for Apple to commission another, exclusively for their streaming service Apple TV+. Now, when it was first announced that this show was getting a second season, I imagine many of us were hoping it would be set in a different time period. I can imagine why then, that quite a few people were initially disappointed that, like the first season, it would again be set in the Maastrichtian stage of the late Cretaceous. Admittedly, I was also in this camp, however, with time I realised that, whilst it wasn't as brand spanking new as maybe we'd hoped, I like to think of it as essentially getting a new flavour of something that was pretty universally liked by the community. The Maastrichtian age is so rich and still has a lot more to show and tell. Much like the first, season two consists of five episodes, each being themed around a type of biome or a general theme, presented and narrated by the one and only Sir David Attenborough. This time around, we have islands, badlands, swamps, oceans, and North America. Yeah, so at first glance, one of these titles sticks out a little bit, doesn't it? But we'll get to that later. In season one, each episode ran for around 35 to 38 minutes by my count, and consisted of six short scenes apiece, except for Forrest, which had seven. There were also separate behind the scenes clips called Prehistoric Planet Uncovered on the show page on the Apple TV app explaining the science behind some of the behaviours shown in the respective episodes. Season 2, however, changes this structure slightly. Islands and oceans have six scenes each, whereas Badlands, Swamps and North America have only five. More crucial is that the Uncovered segments have now been added to the end of the actual episodes, each of which also vary in runtime. Both of these changes mean the run times of the episodes are now significantly shorter than those of season 1, ranging from as short as 28 to as long as 36 minutes. I certainly noticed some episodes felt shorter than others. This isn't a critique per se, as shorter doesn't equal worse by default, but I feel it's worth noting for viewers who may not be as interested in the science of the uncovered segment and just want to see the CGI dinosaurs, you might feel a bit short-changed compared to season one. With that said, let's go over each episode and judge them on their own merits, 
Be aware this review may spoil some scenes or creatures for you if you haven't seen Season 2 yet, as it is still fairly new, so just be mindful of that. Without further ado, let's dive in. Much like Coast was for Season 1, Episode 1, Island is a fantastic start to the second season, and is also one of my personal favourite episodes of the whole show. The first scene, fittingly, starts out in the mouth of a river in southern Europe, where season one left off. After a recent tropical storm, debris has been ripped from the mainland and has formed natural rafts. We see our first clear view of an adult Alcyone on one of these rafts. Whilst only known from North Africa, they were still geographically close to southern Europe in the Maastrichtian, so I'd say it's well within the realm of possibility. The pterosaur is spooked, however, by a giant mosasaur swing below. They don't specify, but I'm pretty sure it's just Mosasaurus Hoffmanni eye again. Jumping in with post-commentary again, as Dr. Naish has confirmed on Twitter that this mosasaur is in fact the genus Prognathodon. Its name means four-jaw tooth, and it was closely related to Mosasaurus, and as such, probably would have looked very similar. So I'd say I can be forgiven for thinking it was the latter genus. You never really get a good view of it in the episode, so it's difficult to comment on the model's accuracy. But like I said, if it looks really similar to this show's Mosasaurus, then I'd say it's pretty good. Despite being a widespread and successful genus, Prognathodon has never actually been found in Romania, but is known from other parts of Europe, such as Belgium. So I'd say it's pretty reasonable for it to have lived around Hatsek Island as well. Alright, and back to Past Hodge. Upon another raft, we see a castaway Zalmoxes, who, not wanting to become Mosasaur food, decides to swim to a much larger raft, which seems to still have fertile soil and vegetation. By a miraculous stroke of luck, he comes across a female already on the raft. The narration then alludes to how these rafts can sometimes wash up on the shores of other islands, and these two may even become pioneers of brand new species. I love this, as this is exactly how the natural phenomenon of speciation works, and I think it's wonderful that it was included. This type of natural raft feels much more believable to me for transoceanic dispersal of land animals than say the driftwood log seen in the episode Pod's Travels in Dinosaur Planet, which, funnily enough, is also about Hatseg Island in Romania. This raft still has a functioning, albeit tiny, ecosystem upon it, providing the herbivores with at least some food for the journey. This scene is short but sweet. In the second scene, we are taken to another island in the giant European archipelago. Whilst not stated, this is the Libornia Formation in Italy. Here we are introduced to the small hadrosaur, Tethys hadros. It is named after the Tethys Sea, which it lived near, and has a distinct bill with forward protruding spikes. Tethys hadros was named in 2009, and was only known from a single specimen, nicknamed Antonio. Antonio was presumed to represent an adult, and was fairly complete, but was missing the tail. As such, total body measurements were difficult, with some concluding 15 feet, with others feeling this was an overestimate. Whilst imprecise, what was consistent is that the measurements for Antonio were significantly smaller than its presumed mainland hadrosaur relatives, concluding that it was a result of insular dwarfism. This changed, however, in 2021, when a paper was published describing a second specimen of Tethys hadros, nicknamed Bruno. Bruno was about 15% larger than Antonio, and had a more robust skull, considered a feature of more mature animals. The researchers therefore concluded that Bruno represented an adult, and Antonio represented a subadult. While showing Tethys hadros was still considerably smaller than other hadrosaurs, the authors found a more important detail. They dated the rocks Tethys hadros were found in were around 80 million years old. This was before the Cretaceous European archipelago had fully fragmented, meaning Tethys hadros may not represent an island dwarf at all. More importantly for us, Similar to the Antarctopelta from Iceworld, this is another rare and unfortunate example of a paper being published during production, which now makes this animal's depiction inaccurate. 
If the information published in this newer paper is correct, it would mean Tethys Hadros would have lived about 10 million years before this episode takes place. Whilst we can always assume that Tethys Hadros may have lived in the Maastrichtian as well, there's no evidence for this. Tethys Hadros also can't be explained away by naming shenanigans either, like the quote-unquote Velociraptor. It's such a shame too, as the model is wonderful and perfect as to be expected. I especially love the green and brown camo style coloration, which, as you'd expect, blends really nicely with the grove of pine saplings where they filmed this scene. We are then reintroduced in a terrifying manner to Hatsigopteryx. Islands is easily the best use of Ashdarkids in the show, and here they are truly horrifying. We first see them soaring in from above the surrounding treetops before seeing them land, towering above the saplings and the Tethys Hadros. Seeing Ashdarkids run is not something I ever wanted to see, and I mean that in the best way possible, as it is so unsettling. As the adult Tethys Hadros flee into the trees, their young end up stranded in the saplings, forced to hide from the predators. The music, cinematography, and pacing all make it so dramatic and tense. It is fantastic. I also like that they show Hatsigopteryx as intelligent. Pterosaur intelligence is very rarely touched upon in paleo media, I feel. So I applaud them for not only tackling it, but for also somehow making Ashdarkids even more terrifying than they already were. As such, after scaring away the adults, the hunting party then stalks the saplings and the deep throaty hissing noises they make. Combined with the way this scene is shot, makes the Hatsigopteryx almost feel like horror film villains. Seeing these giant pterosaurs from the perspective of these baby hadrosaurs hiding in the underbrush is genuinely pretty scary. The young dinosaurs make a run for it, but we see at least two are unlucky and caught by the predators. Seeing the Hatsigopteryx then squabble over their catch just adds to the unsettling vibe and it's great. The pterosaurs then take off, with the narration describing them as island hopping, which I think is a very reasonable inference for a giant flying animal living in a huge archipelago. Wow, what a way to start off the second season. This one was tense and it was so fantastically done. With the gift of hindsight regarding Tethys Hadros's now unfortunate anachronistic appearance here, they could have either set the scene in Hatseg and used Talmatosaurus again from forests, or they could have set the scene in the, oh boy, the Argillus Egre Areptiles formation in France, and used Rabdodon if they wanted to keep the setting somewhere other than Hatseg. This location will actually be used later in the episode Oceans. Regardless, this scene is awesome. In the third scene, ladies and gentlemen, He's done it. Sir David has officially named a specific country. The one in question is the island of Madagascar. Despite the fact that we've been here before in fresh water. Okay, nope, I'm, I'm not reopening that case. Moving on. The narration states that it has been separated from the African mainland for 18 million years. The wording might be a bit confusing, as I can imagine some people interpreting this as meaning it has been separated for 80 million years from the present, when it is actually thought to have separated 80 million years before the setting of the episode. Oddly enough, Madagascar did also separate around 80 million years before the present too, but from the Indian subcontinent. Both Madagascar and India formed separate island landmasses within the Indian Ocean during the Maastrichtian, each with their own endemic fauna, both of which we will see throughout Season 2. Like the aforementioned scene in Freshwater, this scene and the following one both take place in the Mavorano Formation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an unprecedented double blessing. Not only have they named a specific country, we have a crocodilomorph. Simosuk has to be exact, and what an oddball it is. Its name means pug-nosed crocodile, in reference to its short and blunt snout. They are generally thought to be members of the group Notosuchia, a group of crocodilomorphs known almost entirely from Gondwana. 
but how Simosuchus arrived in Madagascar is poorly understood. They were only about two feet long and greatly contrast with modern crocodiles. They were thought to be entirely terrestrial, and thanks to the combination of their blunt snout and leaf-shaped teeth, were thought to be herbivores. I love these little guys so much. Their croc-like armour looks amazing and so believable probably because it looks so much like that of their modern relatives. We see a group of them foraging and resting in what appears to be an appropriate semi-arid floodplain ecosystem. Their rest is disturbed, however, by a female Majungasaurus. After Carnotaurus, this is the second Abelosaur in the show, and similarly, it is the best Majungasaurus put to screen. I love how easily you can tell that this model was based on the paleo art of Gabriel Ugueto, an incredibly talented artist who acted as a consultant for the show. Majungasaurus means Mahajanga lizard after the city of Mahajanga in Madagascar. The name Majungatholus is sometimes incorrectly used to refer to this animal, but this is now considered a junior synonym. It was only of average size for a theropod at around 20 feet long and weighing around a ton, but it was by far the largest carnivore known from Madagascar from the time, and most likely represented the top predator in its ecosystem. It has accurately short, stubby legs and is appropriately chonky. Whilst the colours aren't the most exciting, they are perfectly suited for its environment. I love that this particular female is also blind in one eye as it would be practically impossible for extinct animals to not suffer from the same ailment modern animals do. It's a touch they didn't need to add, but I'm very glad they did, as it adds another hint of realism that helps sell the idea that what we're seeing is real. These were real animals with real hardships, no different than today. We see the predator chase after the Simosuchus, who we then see escaping into burrows. Whilst we have no direct evidence of this, Burrowing behaviour has long been suggested for Simosuchus, due to its stout and robust limbs. We see one male get stuck in a hole cartoon style, who then wards off the comparatively huge Majungasaurus with just a few charges and kicks before then escaping into a burrow. If you think this is unrealistic, I suggest taking a closer look at modern big predators encountering tough, smaller animals. Whilst in documentaries we often want to pick sides, this episode really makes you feel conflicted afterwards, as the narration then explains that the Majungasaurus has had many failed hunts due to her blindness. You sympathise with her and almost feel conflicted, but that's nature and it is wonderfully done, as is this entire scene. The fourth scene is my personal favourite of the episode. It has the unique distinction of being the only scene in the entire show to focus on a mammal, the one in question being a Dalatherium. It was a member of the Gondwana Theria, an ancient extinct group of mammals known only from, you guessed it, Gondwana. The name Adalatherium comes from the Malagasy word Adala, meaning crazy, and the Greek word Therium, meaning beast and Crazy Beast is a very appropriate name for this thing, as it is so strange. First of all, it was around 52 centimetres long and may have weighed as much as 5 kilograms. That may not sound impressive, but by Mesozoic mammal standards, it was huge, the third largest in the world in fact, surpassed only by its contemporary and fellow Gondwanathir, Ventana, and the more distantly related Repenomamus from early Cretaceous China. Here, and in pretty much all reconstructions of this animal, it appears similar to a badger and may have had a similar burrowing lifestyle. This is what is suggested by the structure of the back legs, which are more sprawled and bulky. The front limbs, however, are straighter and positioned under the body, indicative of a sprinter. Its front teeth were like those of a rabbit or rodent, large and ever-growing, suggesting it was a herbivore. These are much more informative of its diet than its back teeth, which are completely unique amongst mammals. It has been suggested that these bizarre adaptations may have been a result of Madagascar's isolation. The model looks perfect for this confusing animal and it looks like a small mammal you could feasibly see today, which is fantastic. 
we see a female returning to her burrow where we see she has a clutch of eggs. Whilst this might also seem strange for a mammal, this is actually one of the more normal things about the crazy beast, as modern monotreme mammals, the platypus and the echidnas, also lay eggs, and it is thought that this is the ancestral condition for mammals that marsupials and placentals have evolved away from. We then see her eggs hatch, and wow, we have come a long way from the cynodont hatchlings in Walking with Dinosaurs that kind of looked like finger puppets at times. These practical Adalatherium hatchlings look, well, real. The saggy skin texture looks incredible. We see them instinctively head towards their mother to feed on milk she secretes from sweat glands on her underside. This is thought to be how mammary glands evolved in mammals until eventually forming distinct teat for offspring to suckle from in marsupials and placentals. A few months pass and her young can now walk and are covered in hair. The mother heads out at night to find food for herself and her litter. Nocturnality is thought to have been the case for most Mesozoic mammals to avoid competing with, and predation from, dinosaurs. The nocturnal bottleneck theory suggests that the reason why modern mammals generally have strong senses of smell and hearing, but comparatively poorer vision compared to reptiles and birds, is because these senses were more useful in the dark of the night to their Mesozoic ancestors. Their warm-blooded metabolism as well as an insulating coat of fur would have also kept them warm in the colder nights, so I am all for showing Adalatherium being at least partly nocturnal. From the undergrowth, a snake watches. We get another cool night vision shot of the female as she comes across Imajungasaurus, potentially the same one we saw earlier, also out at night. She remains still and the dinosaur moves on. At sunrise, we see the mother once again leaving to look for food, leaving her litter unguarded. In her absence, the Mashikasaurus investigates the various holes and burrows in the banking. The narration states that it is particularly well adapted to catching burrowing prey thanks to its long neck and narrow head, which, whilst there's no evidence for, seems pretty plausible to me. While searching the banking, the Mashikasaurus is itself ambushed by the snake we got a glimpse of earlier, Matsoya. A member of an extinct family of snakes, the Matsoids, which lived from the middle of the Cretaceous all the way to the Pleistocene Epoch, living for around 100 million years. They were thought to be constrictors, though unrelated to any modern constricting snakes. As such, we see a huge 25 foot long Matsoya constrict the Mashikasaurus to death. I know it was hunting babies, but considering its other appearance in fresh water, this genus can't catch a break it seems. With so many predators around, that night, the mother Adalatherium decides it's time for her and her offspring to leave. I like how the Matsoya just kind of sits there, watching them leave. The snake does not like what it can see. This scene is just wonderful in every way, shape and form. One of the best in the entire show in my opinion. Obscure species are put in the spotlight and the storytelling is arguably the best in the entire show here. This scene feels the most like Walking With to me. New Blood specifically, with very clear similarities between the Adalatherium and Mashikasaurus, with the Cynodonts and Coelophysis, respectively. It scratched the itch I've been having for those kinds of stories, and I love it for that. The fifth scene then takes us to Antarctica of all places, specifically the Snow Hill Island formation in the Antarctic Peninsula. Now at first I was thinking, oh great, it's fresh water all over again, but then I took like two seconds to think about it, and yeah, as it is today, in the Maastrichtian, the Antarctic Peninsula would have had some islands. Unlike when we visited this location in Ice Worlds with the Antarctopelta, here we see a slightly different region during the winter. We get a really cool thermal shot of a huddle of the enigmatic theropod Improbata. Its name means powerful warrior in Latin, and it was a theropod of uncertain affinities. It is only known from a single incomplete foot, and is usually considered a close relative of birds. 
along with other bird-like dinosaurs like dromaeosaurs and troodontids. As such, it is reconstructed with a full coat of feathers and essentially looks like a dromaeosaur minus the sickle claw. It is estimated at around 16 feet long. We see a pack awaken and stalk the ornithopod Morosaurus as it tries to forage in the snow. It gets its name from the El Moro site on James Ross Island where its remains were found. It was around 16 feet long and was a member of the Elasmaria, a group of ornithopods only known from Gondwana. It had long legs suggesting it was a strong runner and likely had a coating of feathers for insulation in its cold environment. This reconstruction ticks all of the boxes and it looks marvellous. My hat goes off to you again prehistoric planet for the obscure species representation. The amazing snow effects from ice worlds make their return and sure enough they do look amazing. We see the Morosaurus detect its stalkers and make a run for it. This aerial shot where you see the Emperor Barter closing in on it is fantastic. Eventually they chase the Morosaurus to the edge of the forest, forcing it out onto a giant frozen lake. Once again I praise the variety of the filming locations, as whilst at first the scene may look extremely similar to the one in Ice Worlds with the Pachyrhinosaurus, this lake makes it stand out as unique and it's fantastic. Out on the ice, the Morosaurus is able to, quite literally, give the Improbata the slip and escape. This scene is so well done. While seeming a bit out of place at first glance compared to the other scenes taking place in much warmer climates, it is still an island and is solid all around, especially the cinematography. The sixth scene, one of only two this season actually, and the final one of the episode, takes us back once again to southern Europe, this time on a tiny offshore island, presumably off the coast of Italy, as we see a male Hatsigopteryx carrying a dead juvenile Tethys Hadros. Possibly the same one we saw earlier, but it's hard to say, as it's unknown whether the scenes take place concurrently. We see him create an elaborate display of wood and lines in the sand for potential females passing overhead. Eventually, a female lands and investigates. Here we get a good view of both the sexual dimorphism in this genus, with the females having much smaller crests, as well as the elaborate breeding colours of the male, which look great. The male then performs a mating display involving raising his head and quickly clicking his beak, to which the female then joins in. A younger rival male then appears, but is quickly fought off by the older male. The female briefly leaves, but soon returns and accepts the male. The pair mate and the scene ends with the female flying off into the sky. I think it's brilliant to end the episode with a very gentle moment between the Hatsigopteryx, starkly contrasting what we saw earlier. Islands is amazing. Every single scene is magnificent. I'd say this episode has the best stories in the show so far if not the best of the show entirely. Whilst I of course have my critiques of this show, one thing it knows how to do is start a season off with a bang. Much like how Coast was for season 1, Islands is an amazing start to season 2, both having a distinct focus on non-dinosaurs I noticed too. I wonder if that was intentional. Episode 2, Badlands is a real contender for my favourite episode. The first scene takes us to the Deccan Traps, a huge volcanic region in the Cretaceous in India, which are both name dropped. Wow, we really are being spoiled in season 2 so far. While seeming inhospitable, much like the Alora Titan in Ice Worlds, this area is utilised by all female herds of the Titanosaur Isosaurus. Its name refers to the ISI, the Indian Statistical Institute. It is estimated at around 60 feet long and weighing around 15 tons. It had a distinctly shorter and thicker neck than most sauropods, as well as longer front limbs. I have to apologise to the Dreadnoughters, as it has officially been supplanted as my favourite sauropod from the show. The Isosaurus just look amazing. The coloration and patterning is just beautiful. 
Perhaps it's helped by the fact that they always look awesome in every shot they're in, as they're often seen in front of active volcanoes and lava flows. Do I even need to explain why or how this is so cool? The visuals, music and sound design really sell just how dangerous this place is. The narration explains how deadly volcanic gases are released from volcanic vents and in the cooler morning air, they form a thick blanket close to the ground. The isosaur's height allows them to stand far above this layer, kind of like the T-Rex in Death of a Dynasty. It's of course only speculative, but I think it sounds perfectly plausible. Eventually, the isosaurs climb up a giant steep slope to find an enormous caldera, a huge crater formed after a volcano erupts and collapses in on itself due to losing the support of its magma chamber after being emptied. Now, if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'd like to go off on a little bit of a tangent. This episode reminds me of a piece of paleo art by John Conway, titled Cloud Gods. Sauropods are, of course, the largest known land animals to ever live. Understandably, they are often portrayed as such in art or moving pictures. However, Cloud Gods portrays three Brontosaurus of varying sizes, dwarfed by three giant tornadoes. Whilst making this piece, he found that the smaller he drew the Brontosaurus, the bigger they appeared. To put another way, with the tornadoes seemingly being the main subject of the piece and being so massive, surely any animals would not be noticeable. And yet, sauropods are so enormous that they are still visible from so far away. I feel this episode, probably by complete coincidence, utilizes this philosophy really well, as the isosaurs look tiny in this vast landscape, yet are still visible. They are so wonderfully composited and implemented into the scenes. I find myself just looking at this scene and having to pick my jaw up off the floor. I just can't help but gush. My apologies. Going back to the episode, the isosaurs use this caldera as a nesting site, as the geothermal heating is an excellent incubator and the volcanic gases deter predators. We then see dozens of females digging trenches with their hind legs, laying eggs within them, and then covering them again with dirt. In doing so, one female kicks dirt on the face of another. The fact this very dramatic scene manages to then become so uplifting, even managing to squeeze in a funny light-hearted moment, really impresses me honestly. The narration then alludes to the eggs then hatching in a few months where the hatchlings will have to face the perils of the volcanic landscape. Wow. Just wow. Now that is how you start an episode. I'm genuinely at a loss for words right now. Everything about this scene is just mwah, chef's kiss. Absolutely stunning visuals, compelling storytelling, superb music and sound design. This scene feels like magic to me. In the second scene, we are taken to Asia, mainland Asia that is, as don't forget, India is an island landmass at this time. We are once again taken to the Namekt formation in Mongolia. You'd think I'd be sick of this place by this point, yet it's the exact opposite. Every scene set here has been great, and this one is no exception. Dare I say, it may even be the best. Keeping up with this episode's track record of gorgeous filming locations, this scene is set in a beautiful giant desert canyon and it looks so cool. Here we are reintroduced to the quote unquote velociraptors, where we see several parents raising their young within its protective walls. The narration then explains that the reason they nest here is because after seasonal rains, within the heart of the desert, an oasis is formed, shown here to be populated with poplar trees. After a little research, I found that both true poplars of the genus Populus and tulip poplars of the genus Liriodendron, whilst not known from Asia specifically, 
have been found as fossils in North America, dated to the Cretaceous. I'd therefore say it's entirely possible they were also in Asia at this time. I don't know if there was a reason they chose poplars specifically, but I suppose it's not really that important. The point is that this oasis has allowed the growth of plentiful vegetation and attracts many herbivores from around the desert. We see a mixed herd of sauropods consisting of Mongolian titans and the smaller Nemegtosaurus, who we first saw way back in deserts but went unnamed. Its name means Nemegt lizard after the Nemegt formation where it was discovered. It has been estimated at around 40 feet long, which is actually on the smaller side for sauropods. These estimates are based on a fellow Nemegt sauropod, Opisthocelacordia, who we may have seen taking a snooze back in forests. Due to the fact that Nemegtosaurus is only known from cranial material, and Opisthocelacordia only known from post-cranial material, some researchers have questioned whether these may represent the same animal, but because there are no overlapping elements referred to either genus, this is impossible to prove as of now. So both are valid genera. The model appears to have a red head, with Nemegtosaurus's distinct tall skull for a titanosaur. It looks really good. It's just a shame you don't really ever get a good view of it, neither here nor in deserts. These immense sauropods are joined by the much smaller herbivore, Prenocephale. Its name means sloping head, referring to its huge domed skull that sloped downwards towards the end of the snout. It was a type of pachycephalosaur, the first in the show in fact. I'm glad they were added, as they were sadly missed in season 1. They were herbivores known for having thick, bony domes on their skulls a group being named after the type genus Pachycephalosaurus, who we will talk about in the episode Swamps. Prenocephale measured around 7 feet long and weighed around 40 kilograms. The model looks excellent, though this may be the only example of this, but I might actually still prefer the model from Dinosaur Planet. That could just be nostalgia talking though. To reach the oasis, this huge mixed herd has to traverse the plateau, formed by a labyrinth of canyons. The music and sound design are once again incredible here. I'd say the best in the entire show. The way they build this uncomfortable tension as you hear the nervous, droning, echoey calls of the herd trapped within the canyon walls is just out of this world. All the while, we see velociraptors stalking them from higher ground. The narration explains that whilst they wouldn't attack the giant sauropods, we see that the herd is also being stalked by Tarbosaurus. Much like how Deserts was at times, this scene is also very reminiscent of Disney's dinosaur to me. As the predators close in, the herd panics. All this commotion in such claustrophobic conditions creates such palpable tension, and it is amazing. One Nemegtosaurus loses its footing and collapses into a ditch. As the sauropods kick up sand and dust, the much smaller Prenocephale escape to higher ground. These are then ambushed by the Velociraptors, with one chasing the herbivore to another hiding in wait, who then kicks it off the ledge back down into the canyon below. You don't see it land, but you hear it. A pretty brutal death, but far from a graphic one. I personally believe this is within the realm of possibility for an intelligent dinosaur like Velociraptor to pull off. You could consider this pack hunting, but we see earlier that they form monogamous pairs to raise their young, so it is in the parents' best interest to hunt cooperatively. There's no evidence for this, but many species of birds also form monogamous pairs, so I think it would be reasonable for Velociraptor too. We see the Tarbosaurs feeding on the collapsed Nemegtosaurus. I wonder if the predators killed it, or if it was trampled by its herdmates. We then see some baby Velociraptors join their parents to feed on the kill. Wow, Badlands. We're only two scenes in, and that's two scenes that have left me speechless. This is the best hunt in the show, as much as I liked the Chianzausaurus one in Forests, and as spectacular as the Hatsagopteryx one was in Islands, this one takes the cake for me. 
it looks beautiful, the storytelling is compelling, the sound design is chilling, and the tension is off the charts. Incredible. Simply incredible. I am so impressed, Badlands. Well, after two absolute bangers like that, can Badlands keep it up? Well, not quite. At least as far as this scene is concerned, in my opinion. In the third scene, whilst we're still in Mongolia, I believe we are now in the slightly older Barungoyot formation. Probably. It breaks my heart to say this because of how much I loved this episode so far, but sadly, we have the return of confusing geography shenanigans. How, you might be wondering? Well, it's because this scene reintroduces us to Carithoraptor of all animals, where we see the males brooding their eggs and protecting them from the heat of the sun by shading them with their wings. The practical eggs look great, by the way, and have a really distinct knobbly texture. This bothers me, probably more than it should, but it just rubs me the wrong way for a few reasons. First off, Carithoraptor is known to have lived much further south in China. Much like how the geography concerning the Allura Titan scene in Ice Worlds was... uh... odd. They at least had the excuse of hadrosaurs being the best suited dinosaurs to long distance travel. Oviraptorosaurs were generally small, and small animals are typically not as well suited to long distance travel. Granted, this is assuming that the fossils we found in China represent its only known range, which may not be the case. This, however, leads into my second point. I think this bothers me more than, say, the Allura Titan, for example, because if they really wanted to set it in the Barungoyote formation, they had not one, not two, but three choices of native Oviraptorus or genera they could have chosen instead. Conchoraptor, Heiwania, or Nemegtomaya, the third of which would have actually been a very fitting choice, as its name means good mother of Nemegt, as it was discovered on its nest, brooding its eggs like the Carithoraptors are shown doing here. Grievances aside, at night, we see the males strategically leave the nesting sites one at a time to feed, so that their nests are never left wholly unguarded. We are then introduced to one of the less impressive creatures in my opinion, Kuru. It gets its binomial name, Kuru Kula, from the deity of the same name in Tibetan Buddhism. It was a close relative of Velociraptor, and was around the same size. As such, the model is almost indistinguishable. In principle, this doesn't bother me, as this was the case for the Sorolophene hadrosaurs, but I think only seeing it at night doesn't do it any favours, as you can't make out any of the colours really. I think seeing it even for just a little bit during the day would have been nice. So as it stands, there's nothing wrong with the model or anything. I'm just not too fond of this one, or at least not of how it's shown to the audience. We see a female Kuru sneaking up to the nest to steal some of the eggs, once the resident Carithoraptors leave and or aren't watching. One upside to the Carithoraptors reappearing in this scene is that when one of them spots the Kuru, we get the return of their amazing noises as the thief scurries off. The Kuru takes one of the eggs with her to then give to her young, which she calls with a really cool purring sound. It is pretty cute watching the baby Kuru try and crack open the egg. Like I said, this probably isn't that big a deal, but I can't help but feel like they reused the Carithoraptor just so they didn't have to make a new model for another Oviraptorosaur. I feel this scene could have been done in a much neater manner had they just tweaked the Carithoraptor model slightly and called it something else. Whilst I like the Kuru, the babies especially, as they actually seem to have some interesting coloration, the adult just looks like a Velociraptor in the dark. Maybe it's just because the prior two scenes were so stellar that this one not being of the same calibre bothers me more. I just feel like some opportunities were missed here. The fourth scene fortunately ramped the quality back up in my eyes, not quite to the same level as the first two scenes for me, but still really great. We are presumably taken back to the Nemegt formation, where we are properly introduced to Tarchia, 
who, like the Nemegtosaurus from earlier, and the Therizinosaurus in forests, made a cameo way back in deserts, but now we get a great look at it. The name Tarcha means brainy one in Mongolian, as it was presumed to have had a larger brain than its fellow contemporary ankylosaur, Cychania. It was an average sized ankylosaurid, estimated at 18 feet long and weighing 2 tons. This model looks wonderful, one of the most interesting colours, but perfectly suited to its desert ecosystem. I love how this scene details aspects of its biology, adapted for living in arid environments. Darker patches over its eyes shade them from the sun. There's also some fantastic inference from its large nostrils known from the fossils, wherein their large noses cool the air they breathe out. This condenses and conserves any water they may have otherwise lost. Many ankylosaurs were known to have had large nostril openings in the skull, Whilst at first it was assumed they had a strong sense of smell, CT scans of their brain cases showed that they lacked large olfactory bulbs, an enlarged part of the brain in vertebrates with strong senses of smell. Another theory suggests that they used it for amplifying their vocalizations, which isn't showcased here, but may also be something they could do. Here we see two young male brothers searching for water, the narration explains how aeolian processes, those being the natural processes of wind shaping the Earth's surface, are especially prevalent in deserts due to the high temperatures fueling strong winds, carving the rocks into the beautiful and sometimes quite eccentric shapes seen here. This also removes soil, making it difficult for plants to grow, and in turn, for herbivores to find food. We see the brothers squabble over a small bush, with one driving off the other to look on his own for a while. The narration also speculates that Tarchia has a mental map of the desert for navigation. This is thought to be the case for many modern animals, so I see no reason why Tarchia couldn't do it too. As such, we see the now lone brother walk through a canyon to find a small oasis. Here we see a small herd of Prinocephalae already drinking, who looks so derpy from the front, I love it. As the lone Tarchia approaches, they start to headbutt him to try and drive him off, but he promptly swings his huge club tail at the ground, and the smaller herbivores decide they don't have a death wish. We then, however, meet an adult Tarchia who's laid claim to this spot, challenge the younger animal. Whilst initially backing down, the brother then arrives to back him up, and the older animal backs down. The scene ends with the two brothers finally getting a drink. There's something about this scene that just has a very pleasant quality to it. Considering how intense the episode started, I think a much more light-hearted scene helps balance out the tone of this episode. I really like this part, even if there's not that much to it. In the fifth and final scene, we head back to the Deccan in India. This is one of the very rare instances of a payoff set up in an earlier scene in Prehistoric Planet. The first scene ended with the Isosaurs laying their eggs in the caldera, with the narration hinting that the young will hatch in a few months and face the perils of the landscape. Most episodes would just end that storyline there, but Badlands actually continues that plot thread by showing us the babies hatching. Much like the Diplodocus in Walking with Dinosaurs, and especially the Saltosaurs in Dinosaur Planet, we see the R strategy of the sauropods in full effect, as hundreds of well-developed baby isosaurs hatch all at once. Much like their adult counterparts, the juveniles look amazing. A fantastic conclusion is that of an egg tooth, a structure some egg-laying animals have to help them break out of their eggs that they gradually lose as they grow. We then see the hatchlings eating their mother's dung of all things. The narration states that this is both nutritious and introduces healthy bacteria into their guts. Modern animals like elephants, hippos and pigs also do this, so I feel it's reasonable to assume dinosaurs partook in this behaviour too. This also familiarises the hatchlings with the distinct pheromones of their mother's herds, making it easier for them to find them when they are old enough to join a herd. Despite the poisonous gases now being gone thanks to strong winds, 
The narration then alludes to some of the dangers in the area. The first are scorching hot pools of mud. We see one hatchling slip and almost collapse into one and struggle to climb out. Its fate is left ambiguous and now I don't know how to feel. A really cool aspect of ecology is touched upon here as the mother's dung once again comes to the rescue as it contains seeds which have been fertilized by the dung and plants have now grown from them in isolated patches. The second danger is that with the poisonous gases now gone, predators can now move in. As such, we are introduced to Rajasaurus. Its name means King Lizard, owing to Raja, a royal title in South Asia. This is the third and final abelosaur in the show, and it is my favourite of the bunch. It is estimated at around 22 feet long and weighing around a ton. I like how there are only two dinosaurs from India in the show, both of which only appear in this one episode, and they might just be the two coolest looking animals in the show. The texturing on this thing looks so weathered and well composited into the shots especially. It's so beautifully animated too, walking and hopping to traverse such uneven ground while still feeling the weight as it bounds around extra props to the animators for this one, as I feel it must have been one of the trickier scenes to do. It truly looks like an animal that belongs in its environment, and I'm just blown away by it. This brings us to the colour scheme. Dark red and grey with hints of yellow. Literal fire. This just looks so cool. Sadly, this is another baby killing scene, but I could not care less. It's nature, and this scene is so well executed. The scene ends with many of the babies surviving the onslaught and reaching the safety of the forests. Badlands is such a tricky case for me. When this episode is good, it's the best the show has to offer in my opinion. The first, second and fifth scenes are all near the top when thinking of scenes I enjoy the most from this show. The fourth scene I really enjoy too, even if not much happens in it. The third scene is what makes this episode hard to place for me, as I feel it's not that exciting. The Carithoraptor was not welcomed by me, and the Kuru was undershown. With that said, judging it on its own merits, I still think it's pretty well done. This episode took my breath away multiple times, which is quite the accomplishment. Episode 3, Swamps, is a weird one for me. I'll elaborate more on what I mean as we go on, but I feel this will probably be the episode with the most hot takes from me, if you will. The first scene is set in Northeast Asia, which I assume to mean the Oderchukan Formation in Russia, where Alora Titan is known from, but whether we've actually been here before it's hard to say since, well, we've talked about why. Here we see baby Ashdarkids on an island in a vast swamp. Okay, so here's my first hot take on this episode. This is, in my opinion, the weakest scene in the entire show, at least for me, for a variety of reasons. So first things first, we have some very slight geography shenanigans, question mark? I hesitate to call them this, as they are very minor here, so, oddly enough, I think these Ashdarkids are the exact same model of those we saw in Freshwater, which likely represent the juvenile form of the giant unnamed Mongolian Ashdarkid from Deserts. If we are indeed in Russia, then we're outside of its known range. Granted though, we've seen much more extreme instances of globe-trotting Ashdarkids before, both of which also in Freshwater, funnily enough. The distance from Nemegd to Uderchukan is considerably smaller than that of the Quetzalcoatlus, going from its known range in the southern US to South Africa or Argentina. So I think by comparison, this is well within the realm of possibility. Speaking of, this scene would actually work pretty well as a sort of follow-up to said scene from Freshwater, where the Quetzalcoatlus lays her eggs on a wetland island, and here we see baby Ashdarkids hatching on a wetland island. But they set it somewhere else because... I don't know. 
The main conflict for this scene comes from the young pterosaurs needing to reach the bigger islands in the swamp to be able to have enough food to eat. We see one pterosaur fall into the water. Very interesting to see an Ashdarkid swimming, I have to say. This fellow is quickly snapped up by a Shamosuchus. We finally have an aquatic crocodilomorph, but at what cost? This is my second hot take. The Shamosuchus gets my pick for worst creature in the show. I think this is for two reasons. The first is accuracy. This is a very rare misstep in the accuracy department for the show, which for the most part is flawless. Here, Shamosuchus is portrayed pretty much just like a modern crocodile or alligator. However, Shamosuchus had some unique aspects to its biology that sets it apart from these animals. Unlike crocs and gators, whose eyes and nostrils are raised above the skull as an adaptation for ambushing terrestrial animals, Shamosuchus' skull shows neither of these features, suggesting they had a different feeding strategy. The teeth appear better suited for crushing aquatic animals such as mollusks. This model is actually a pretty perfect fit for its close relative, Paralligator. Not only is its morphology and behaviour more appropriate, but it's also known from the Nemegd formation. So, if we just assume that this creature is actually Paralligator, that would mean it can be set in the Nemegd formation, meaning the Ashdarkids would safely be in their known range. All is well, right? Wrong. My biggest problem with this scene is much more fundamental, and is a problem we haven't encountered yet in the show. The animation. I think this might be the only time where this show's fantastic and fluent animation actually works to its detriment. The pterosaurs look great, but the Shamosuchus just look uncanny to me. If you look at modern crocodilians, their movements are actually pretty wooden, slow and kind of clumsy most of the time. These things move in a way that just looks way too athletic and well, animated. What really drives this point home is that modern croc footage is intercut with the CGI sometimes, and the difference in movement just look so off to me. Because I apparently have to keep kicking the scene while it's down, there's another thing about it I've noticed. Okay, so I'm assuming that you've watched the show yourself and or watched all or most of this video so far. Keeping that in mind, I'm going to give a brief summary of this scene, and you tell me if this sounds familiar. Baby pterosaurs first learn to fly, being careful they have enough height to make it to their intended destination, or else they'll fall into the water, all the while narrowly dodging predators much larger than them. If you thought yes, then I don't blame you. Yeah, so this is almost the exact same premise as the pterosaur scene from Coast, but just inferior in my eyes. The storytelling isn't as good. The satisfying payoff of introducing Phosphata Draco earlier, and then later seeing one of the Alcyone crash land and be eaten by it. Stuff like that is great, but is just absent here. When thinking of all of the many scenes in the show, all of these issues combined make it difficult for me to put it anywhere other than at the bottom. The second scene is a step up in my opinion. We are now taken to South America, specifically the Allen Formation in Argentina. If I was right in my assumption that this is where the last scene of Freshwater is set, then this is technically our second visit here, but the first time where the narration actually clarifies that we're in South America. We get a sort of not quite fake out with a garfish being called a predator before being promptly plucked from the water by an Ostroraptor meaning Southern Thief or Snatcher, depending on the research you go by, it is either a member of the Unanlagiene subfamily within Dromaeosaurids, or an Unanlagiid, where it and its closest relatives form their own family, separate from Dromaeosaurs. This group is characterized by its incredibly elongated snouts, thought to have been an adaptation to a piscivorous lifestyle. What is unique about Ostroraptor within this group is that it is huge, with estimates of around 16 to 20 feet long. By dinosaur standards, this is nothing special, 
but for dromaeosaur slash bird-like dinosaur standards, this thing was enormous. Anatomically, the model looks superb, but there's some things about it that bug me. The first is a more trivial thing, and it could just be me, but do the eyes look weird to anyone else? Maybe it's just the whiter colour around the pupil, but there's something weird about it to me. The bigger issue I have is that, and this may be hot take number three for me so far, the texture on them doesn't look that convincing to me, and they look off. What's so strange is that there are a few close-up shots of its scaly feet that look amazing, so I don't know why the feathers look almost blurry. I personally adore Unalagians, Buitre Raptor being one of my favourite dinosaurs actually, so I'm very happy to see them represented in media, as the only other instance I can think of is the Unalagia from Dinosaurs Giants of Patagonia, which, despite how much I adore that film, that model is just not a very good Unalagia. We see several adult Ostoraptors gathering around a crowded, fish-filled pool, occasionally fighting over territory. We then see a younger male scavenging on the leftovers of the adults whilst they're distracted, squabbling over the best fishing spot. This scene is extremely short and simple. I like it, but I feel it could have been better. My personal grievances with the model aside, the cinematography also felt a bit cramped here for my liking. Many of the shots felt very close and kind of claustrophobic, making it difficult to fully picture and mentally establish the environment these animals are in. I love Unan Lagines, but this scene felt a bit lacklustre to be honest. Swamps? You're not off to a great start for me I'm afraid. In the third scene, we head back to the Maverano Formation in Madagascar. This is our third visit and the fourth and final scene set here in the show. We see Mashikasaurus for the third time. Well buddy, your last two appearances weren't the most flattering were they? The baby got eaten by a giant frog in freshwater, an adult got eaten by a giant snake in island, but come on, third time's the charm. What has swamps got for us? It, it, it gets scared by a BL's boot phone runs away, never to be seen again. Maybe it has frog-related PTSD from seeing his brother be killed by one when he was a kid. Why is this genus, Prehistoric Planet's punching bag? Well, if I did it for the bear dog in Walk with Beasts, then it would only be fair to... Yeah, no, I'm starting up this campaign again, just as for Mashikasaurus. Jokes aside, this scene is really good. Like, really, really good head and shoulders above the prior two in my opinion. Deciding to take the day off from eating people's children, we see a male Beelzebufo trying to attract a female to his personal muddy pool. I know I've been quite hard on the effects so far this episode, but the Beelzebufo looks so unbelievably real, I even showed my mum, to which she said, how? Followed by stunned silence. That might not translate for everyone, but that means it's very impressive. It probably helps that we have frogs today that the animators could use as a base, but even still, it just looks phenomenal. This also shows to me that they can in fact animate animals who have modern relatives really well. So what happened with the Shamosuchus? Slash Paralligator, or whatever that thing is. One slight nitpick I have is that they animate it moving its head and neck quite a lot which frog skeletons are not really designed to do. It's possible Beelzebufo could do this, but there's no evidence to support this, and I, and I imagine most paleontologists, deem it implausible. It's only a small issue though. Whilst calling to nearby females, the frog's serenade is rudely interrupted by a herd of Rapatosaurus. I hinted at these guys way back in freshwater when I thought that random titanosaur was one of these guys, but this is their actual and only appearance. They get their name from Rapato, a giant in the folklore of the native Malagasy people of Madagascar. They are estimated at around 50 feet long. The coloration on these guys isn't the most interesting, but still naturalistic and suitable for their environment. The titanosaurs have come here for a mud bath, and I love that we're seeing interesting behaviour like this. 
the Beelzebufo narrowly avoids being stood on, a fate met by one in Dinosaur Revolution. This scene has the distinction of being the funniest in the entire show. Luckily, it's not overly comedic like the aforementioned Dinosaur Revolution, as unlike that show, here the comedic moments feel completely natural, and not one feels forced. Seeing this frog get essentially kicked out of his house just so these dinosaurs can wallow around in the mud is just funny. Upon spotting a new pool, the Beelzebufo does a majestic tuck and roll, deciding the most sensible thing to do is to hop between these enormous sauropods rather than just wait for them to leave. I just realised that this is literally prehistoric Frogger. Upon somehow making it past the herd to the pool, he tries to call to females again, but the Repetosaurs are so noisy rolling in the mud that he can't be heard. Luckily the herd finally leaves and their footprints quickly fill with water, forming new pools for the frog. Shout out to paleo artist Joshua Nooper for thinking of this exact same concept months prior. This scene is just brilliant, it's so fun and light-hearted, but the conflict still feels believable. The effects also look breathtakingly real, a massive step up from the previous scenes in my opinion. So unlike Freshwater, so far, Swamps has been completely consistent with sticking to stories based around actual swamp ecosystems. Until we get to the fourth scene which completely throws that concept out the window as we are taken to a dry inland basin in North America. If I had a nickel for every time Prehistoric Planet made an episode about freshwater ecosystems that struggled to stay related to them, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird it happened twice. Heck, it, it's weird it happened once, how does this even happen? Here we are introduced to a herd of Pachycephalosaurus, meaning thick-headed lizard, it was a close relative of Prenocephalae from Badlands, though slightly larger, with estimates at around 14 feet long. Now the classification for this animal is very interesting, as two other Pachycephalosaur genera, Stygimoloch and Dracorex, both having skulls with much flatter domes and larger spikes, have since been synonymized with Pachycephalosaurus, thought to represent subadult and juvenile growth stages respectively. Interestingly, the model here seems to be based on the subadult stage, formerly assigned to Stygimoloch based on the head spikes, rather than that of an adult which has much smaller and rounder knobs. Perhaps this is a herd of subadults. The model looks incredible, easily the best Pachycephalosaurus ever put to screen in my opinion. That being said, I do still love the one from Jurassic Park The Lost World. The coloration of both the males and females looks fantastic. In terms of more specific locations, this one is a bit tricky, as Pachycephalosaurus is known from quite a few formations throughout Western North America. All of these localities seem to be very close to the ancient shore of the Western Interior Seaway, but I'm sure they could have travelled further inland, where there were more arid conditions. Let's just say we're in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. I love that this scene showcases their potentially omnivorous diet, with them eating both roots and insects. Whilst they were long assumed to be herbivores, Pachycephalosaur teeth do show adaptations to both herbivory and carnivory. It's also possible they were simply for eating different plants to the other herbivores they lived alongside, such as Ceratopsians and Hadrosaurs, to avoid competition. We see their herd structure is led by a dominant male. We don't have much evidence for their social structure, but the inferences we can make from certain injuries on their fossils are very interesting. We see a younger male harassing some of the other herd members, to which the leader then challenges him to put him in his place. It was long assumed that pachycephalosaurs use their thick, domed skulls for intraspecific combat by butting heads with one another but there was next to no evidence for this behaviour for around 80 years, until 2013, where lesions on their domes were found extremely consistently among many genera with rounded domes. Specimens with flatter domes, however, showed no signs of injury, as would be expected if these represented juveniles, which is now thought to be the case. As such, we get a fantastic fight scene between the two males, 
We even get a fake out climax where the younger male pins the older one and bellows in victory too early, before then being rammed to the ground. We then see the loser exiled from the herd. I don't know if there are any modern animals that do this, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are some. If you know of any cases of this, please do let me know in the comments. Okay, so similar to how in Freshwater, I tried to judge the scenes on their own merit and not just on their relevance to the episode's title. Ignoring the fact that this scene has literally nothing to do with swamps, it is fantastic. Again though, I have to ask, why is it in this episode? This scene in particular would actually work really well in a different episode if you ask me, but I'll talk more about that later. Swamps has been really polarising for me so far. Two scenes I really wasn't too fond of, followed by two I think are fantastic. So what about the fifth and final scene? Well, unlike the previous, where I wasn't too sure on the specific location, this scene I am pretty confident is set in Hell Creek. This is probably the best representation of this famous formation ever put to screen. As much as I love walking with dinosaurs and prehistoric park, the volcanic lava flows of Chile are not thought to be that representative of this ecosystem. When Dinosaurs Roamed America was a better fit by filming in Florida, but this here in Prehistoric Planet is mwah, chef's kiss. This is the definitive portrayal of Hell Creek. We see herds of Edmontosaurus and Triceratops, with their varying horn sizes in tow once again, being watched by a pair of Tyrannosaurs. I like that they wait until it's dark to hunt, where they can use their excellent low light vision, as Tyrannosaurs are thought to have had the largest eyes of any land animal. I also like how this scene showcases T-Rex as a fairly intelligent animal, as one of them strategically spooks a herd of Edmontosaurus towards the other, ambushing one of the herbivores as the other then joins with the assist. Believe it or not, but this is the first and only time we see T-Rex hunt in the show, and I'd say it was marvellously done. Whilst not super related to swamps, the scene does establish that Hell Creek consists of huge wetlands, so I think it's fine. My main issue with the scene is honestly that it was too short. I would have loved to have seen more interactions with the actual swamp habitat they're in, and maybe to see some Hell Creek fauna we haven't seen yet, but I'm still pretty happy with what we got. Whilst I don't think this scene was on par with the previous two, it was much better than the first two for me, so it ends up right down the middle. So in another weird parallel to my experience with season 1, after a wonderful first two episodes, the third, based on freshwater environments, suffered a bit of a drop in quality for me. Now there is no such thing as a bad episode of Prehistoric Planet. In fact, I think it speaks volumes of the show's quality that the quote-unquote worst this show has to offer is superior to like 90% of Paleo Docs. That said, I think this is the weakest episode of season 2, at least for me. Episode 4, Oceans, was an episode I wasn't really that excited for when I first saw the episode titles revealed for season 2. That being said, I kept an open mind and judged it on its own merit. In the first scene, unfortunately the narration doesn't specify what ocean we are in. We see a giant unidentified mosasaur swimming around a reef. Hiding between the cracks in the reef, we see another, much smaller mosasaur, Phosphorosaurus, meaning phosphate lizard. It was only around 10 feet long, considerably smaller than the 60 foot giants we've seen in the past. The model looks wonderful, and I really like its striped, patchy coloration. It had the largest eyes proportionally of any mosasaur, leading researchers to believe it hunted in deep water and or at night. Phosphorosaurus does help us narrow down the location at least, assuming we're in its known range. It is only known from two locations, Belgium and Japan. I'm inclined to think we're in the latter location due to the presence of lanternfish, fossils of which are known from Maastrichtian Japan. So let's say this scene takes place in the Hakobuchi Formation on the island of Hokkaido, Japan. 
Speaking of lantern fish, we then see a huge shoal of the bioluminescent fish rise to the surface waters, partaking in the Diel vertical migration, a natural phenomenon modern aquatic animals partake in where they rise to the surface waters during the night to feed in the safety of the dark whilst many daytime predators are inactive. Phosphorosaurus takes advantage of this and feeds on the glowing shoal. This sequence reminds me a lot of the Ophthalmosaurus hunting in the dark in Cruel Sea from Walking with Dinosaurs. Fitting considering Phosphorosaurus is essentially a Mosasaur trying to be an Ichthyosaur. The filming location, music and sound design give off such an otherworldly feel. It is so cool and I love it. The next day, we see the giant Mosasaur active again, forcing the Phosphorosaurus into hiding. Whilst I would usually assume this was Mosasaurus Hoffmanii, that species is currently not known from the Pacific Ocean. More likely, this represents quote unquote Mosasaurus hobetsuensis, which is also known from Japan. This taxon, however, has a problematic classification as it is only known from fragmentary remains and is only tentatively assigned to the genus Mosasaurus, which, like I said earlier, is currently not known from the Pacific. More on that later. I was really surprised by how much I liked this scene. It is really solid and I love how it focused on a more obscure and quote-unquote less impressive Mosasaur, like Phosphorosaurus, rather than one of the larger ones we've seen before. The filming location and cinematography reminded me a lot of Cruel Sea, and that is no bad thing where I'm concerned. The second scene takes us to Hell's Aquarium again, aka the Western Interior Seaway in North America. For a more specific location, let's say it's the Fox Hills formation around modern North Dakota. Here we see a huge bait ball of fish being hunted by the penguin-like marine bird Hesperornis. Its name means western bird, and it was around 6 feet long, huge for Mesozoic bird standards. Whilst the model looks incredible with a wonderful colour scheme, I do have some issues here. The first is potential anachronism. As far as my knowledge goes, the genus Hesperornis is only known from the older Campanian stage of the Cretaceous. Unnamed Hesperornifs, however, are known from Maastrichtian North America, which may turn out to be Hesperornis itself. I see this as a similar situation to the Velociraptor, so I can let this slide. The bigger issue I have, however, is that whilst the model looks wonderful, its animation looks a bit wooden. Its movements don't look all that convincing to me at times, which is a shame. Whilst the birds are busy catching fish, we are introduced to what I imagine is a lot of people's favourite extinct fish, myself included, Zephactinus. Its name means sword ray, and it was a voracious predatory fish that could grow to around 20 feet long. We have direct fossil evidence of it swallowing huge prey whole, which the narration even alludes to. The famous fish within a fish specimen on display in the Sternberg Museum of Natural History in Kansas shows a 14 foot individual that shortly died after swallowing another large fish, Gillicus, whole and dying before it could be digested, presumably from the struggling fish rupturing some of the ex-fish's internal organs. I'm gonna be completely honest, I'm not a huge fan of this model. Like with the Shamosuchus in Swamps, the Zephactinus just doesn't quite look like a living fish to me. Maybe it's just me, but something about the texture just looks off. It also suffers from some wooden animation like the Hesperornis too. There may also unfortunately be some accuracy issues too. I'm no fish expert, but I've seen some posts and comments around social media that I now cannot find to save my life for some reason saying that apparently the bones around the mouth on this model aren't quite right. If anyone can shed some light on that, please do let me know in the comments. In almost total opposite fashion to what has been this show's trend so far, this actually represents one of the weaker reconstructions of this animal ever put to screen in my opinion, with the Chased by Sea Monsters rendition still being my favourite. 
With that said, I don't think the model looks bad or as uncanny as the Shemosukas did, so it's ahead at least on those grounds. We see a school of them arrive to also hunt the bait fish, but soon turn to hunting the Hesperonis. We get a cool sequence of a Hesperonis narrowly dodging the giant fish before it tires and gives up. The scene then ends by showing a Zephactinus killing and eating another of its own kind. A pretty grim way to go out, but that's just nature. This scene does have its problems, the animation being the biggest one, but on the whole, I still quite like it. It actually reminded me a lot of both Chased by Sea Monsters as well as Sea Monsters A Prehistoric Adventure. The third scene is perhaps the most interesting in the entire show in my opinion. It takes us to the coast of an island in southern Europe, where, I believe for the first time ever on screen, we see not only ammonite eggs, but also the baby ammonites that then hatch, and oh my god they are the cutest thing ever. A huge school of them have been carried by the waves from the ocean into tide pools. Now, tide pools in their own right are fascinating ecosystems, but prehistoric tide pools? Now that is something unique that I have never seen tackled before. This is all new, unfamiliar territory for me, and I applaud the creators for showcasing both ammonite life cycles and a totally novel ecosystem for paleodox as far as I know. This episode, similar to Coasts, features a lot of modern animal footage. An obvious example is when we see a crab also occupying the tide pool, being able to leave once the tide goes down due to it being able to move on land. The baby ammonites, however, become stranded in the pool as it begins to evaporate from the heat of the sun. Another threat that goes unmentioned, but I imagine is also present, is one that modern animals in tide pools also face, water anoxia, due to many organisms using up the pool water's limited oxygen. We then see one of the coolest and most fascinating things I have ever seen in a paleo dock. The baby ammonites congregate at the pool's edge and cooperatively push one another up and over the bare rock to get to a larger pool. I have no idea if this is based on any known modern animal behaviour, so again, if any of you know more about this than me, please do let me know in the comments. Many of the baby ammonites are then swept back out to sea by the rising tide. Many, however, don't make it and become stranded on the land. These are then eaten by a baby pyroraptor. Great, now we have babies eating babies. As far as I know, the pyroraptor is the only instance where we only see the juvenile of an animal. Oops! I'll refrain from going into detail about this creature, as it looks almost indistinguishable from the other dromaeosaur chicks. And without an adult, there's nothing to talk about where accuracy is concerned. Its presence does confirm to me though that this scene is most likely set in the formation in southern France. Needless to say, I love this scene. It is so unique and fascinating, not to mention well done. There is more baby killing, but we will never forget that they dried for our sins. The fourth scene is set in the, quote, very heart of the Pacific Ocean, where we are reintroduced to Tarangisaurus, who we saw way back in coasts, as a pod hunts schools of fish around various atolls and canyons. The cinematography of this scene is gorgeous. I especially love the shots of the plesiosaurs hunting fish from below. Tarangisaurus is, of course, only known from New Zealand, but I'm sure they could have ventured out into the deep, open ocean. We then see them being stalked by a Mosasaurus, which unfortunately is introduced via a reused shot from coasts, which is a bit off-putting, especially since the colours don't match up. This is a very weird occurrence. So, like I said earlier with the first scene, the genus Mosasaurus isn't known definitively from the Pacific. The unnamed Mosasaur we saw earlier living alongside Phosphorosaurus had the benefit of not being referred to by a genus, yet ironically has some support for being called Mosasaurus, even if it is only tentative. 
This one, however, is definitively referred to as Mosasaurus, and based on the fact they reused the shot of the red-backed male from Coasts, would lead me to believe, at least, that this is meant to represent M. Hoffmanii again. At this point, I almost feel like I have to apologise on behalf of Moanosaurus, as it's now had two perfect opportunities to appear, being a contemporary of Tarangisaurus, where it's just been replaced by other Mosasaur genera that are unknown from the setting of the scene, for seemingly no good reason. In coasts, it was Kaikaifalu, which is only known from Antarctica, and now in Oceans by Mosasaurus, which isn't definitely known from the Pacific. Moanosaurus is even really closely related to Mosasaurus, so you'd barely even need to tweak the model and just call it a different name, and boom, you're good to go. At this point, I have to ask the creators of Prehistoric Planet, what is your vendetta against Moanosaurus? Like I said about the Kaikaifalu back in coasts, Mosasaurus could feasibly have a cosmopolitan distribution across the globe, so I suppose it's not a big deal. I just find it strange that they seem to be making it unnecessarily harder on themselves to avoid scrutiny on these things. Like with the Quetzalcoatlus in freshwater being in southern Africa, it's still completely plausible of course, I just find it surprising. We see the giant Mosasaurus launch an attack on the Tarangisaurus by utilising the Sea Start, a position aquatic animals use that allows them to go from being stationary to immediately accelerate in a chosen direction. Being so huge and powerful, the Mosasaur is able to rocket to the surface, attacking the pod from below. Like with the Changiosaurus in forests, I like that we see the first hunt fail, as most hunts in nature often do. The second attempt, however, the Mosasaurus successfully bullets into a young Tarangisaurus, the impact of such a huge animal alone being enough to kill it, carrying it clean out of the water, giving us that sweet promo shot. Weird geography aside, I think this scene is wonderfully executed and researched, as well as being gorgeous to look at. In the fifth scene, we get the oh-so-rare follow-up to a previous scene. Here we are taken to, quote, the coast of Europe, where we see beds of seagrass, which were in fact around at the end of the Cretaceous. So I think it's really cool that they featured it in the show. This leads me to believe this is set specifically in or near the Maastricht formation of both Belgium and the Netherlands. The baby Ammonites from earlier have grown and are now identifiable as the genus Nostoceras, meaning return horn, as its shell coils back on itself. Despite being around since the Devonian period for over 300 million years, Ammonites had stayed very close to the ancestral coiled shell for most of their history, these forms being collectively referred to as homomorph Ammonites. In the Cretaceous, however, they began to experiment with some very outlandish shell shapes, these forms being heteromorph Ammonites. In this scene, we are introduced to an awesome variety of Ammonites, and like I said in Coasts, I am so glad to see Ammonites getting so much press in prehistoric planets. One of these genera being Baculites, meaning walking stick rock, referring to its almost straight shell. Another is Diplomoceras, whose shell was shaped almost exactly like a giant paperclip. There are also some unidentified homomorph Ammonites seen here, which I believe are Sphenodiscus, but we'll talk about them more in the next episode. This scene is magnificent. Barely anything happens other than just showcasing the insane diversity of Ammonites and their shell shapes. The filming location too is very unique, and again I must stress how glad I am at how much representation Ammonites get in this show. In the sixth and final scene, we are taken to Antarctica, specifically the Lopez de Bertodano formation in the Antarctic Peninsula. Here we see sea ice has formed, and amongst the few gaps in the ice, a part of the plesiosaur Morturnaria comes up for air. It is named after Dr. Mort Turner, a geologist who studied the rocks of Antarctica. Size estimates are difficult to determine for this genus, as it is only known from juvenile specimens. 
A paper published in 2003, however, declared the genus a junior synonym of the fellow elasmosaurid Aristonectes, known from Antarctica but also South America. A later paper from 2017, however, reaffirmed Morternaria as its own distinct genus. The narration may even reference this connection between these two taxa, as it states that these Morternaria have migrated here for spring from South America. A very plausible behaviour to boot. Morternaria is a very unique plesiosaur, as it is thought to have utilised a strange kind of filter feeding that is showcased here by scooping up mouthfuls of sediment, by having their mouths partly open, their teeth form a sieve to filter out any tiny animals and allow the sediment to escape. The scene ends with them returning to the surface to breathe. I like this scene, but it feels way, way too short. Oceans is in fact the shortest episode of the show at only 28 minutes. I don't see why this scene couldn't have been longer. After being a bit disappointed by the previous one, and considering I also wasn't really that excited for it, I was so pleasantly surprised by this one. I got a lot of Cruel Sea vibes from this episode, which for those who may not know, is my favourite episode of Walking With Dinosaurs, so that gives it bonus points from me. Brownie points aside, I think this episode is solid, though not without some problems. Everything involving the Ammonites, I loved. The speculation in this episode is also really creative and interesting, while still feeling very plausible. Whilst I found some of the creatures seemed a bit too rigid in their movement, and I do wish the final scene was a bit more fleshed out, my overall experience of Oceans was solid, and such a nostalgic treat. Episode 5, North America, is the final episode of Season 2, and of the show as a whole, as it stands now. I hinted at this earlier, but... Yeah, that title does stick out a bit compared to the other episodes, doesn't it? When I first saw the reveal of this episode's title, aside from making the obvious sarcastic comment of, Ooh, North America is my favourite biome, an exciting thought then occurred to me. If the entire episode is set in North America, maybe this episode will have a narrative style more akin to that of Walking With. Could it be? Certain individuals whose lives we, the audience, follow for the duration of the story? Well, no. North America shares the same structure as the other episodes, with the distinction that all of the subjects featured lived in, you guessed it, North America. The first scene takes us to the southern shores of the Western Interior Sea. Walking down the beach, we see a herd of the Titanosaur Alamosaurus named after the Ojo Alamo Formation in New Mexico, where it was discovered, and presumably where this scene takes place. Alamosaurus is the biggest creature to appear in the show, and perhaps ever to live in North America, depicted here at around 100 feet long and weighing 80 tons. This is quite a high estimate, though I suppose it's possible they could have reached this size. Alamosaurus is a very interesting dinosaur, as its presence represents not only the first titanosaur known from North America, but the end of the North American sauropod hiatus. This was a gap noticed in the fossil record, where sauropods, which had been the dominant land herbivores during the Jurassic and early Cretaceous, seemed to disappear in the late Cretaceous until the appearance of Alamosaurus during the Maastrichtian. Whilst there are differing theories on this, there are two that are most prevalent. The first suggests that there were still sauropods on the continent during the gap, but due to sampling bias, no fossil evidence has yet been found of them. The second hypothesis, and the one that seems to be the most supported currently, suggests that sauropods had indeed gone extinct in North America, possibly due to the Western Interior Seaway flooding their preferred lowland habitats and or sauropods being outcompeted by hadrosaurs due to the former experiencing potential niche overlap during younger growth stages with the latter. In this scenario, sauropods are indeed absent from North America until the appearance of Alamosaurus. It, however, is not closely related to any other North American sauropods 
and is suggested to have been an immigrant either from Asia or South America. Asia seems to be considered the less likely candidate for Alamosaurus's homeland, as it would require crossing the Bering Strait between Asia and North America, which was well within the Arctic Circle during the Maastrichtian. Research has shown that sauropods were generally poorly adapted to living at high latitudes compared to most dinosaur groups, possibly due to the lack of food for several months during the polar winter. South America, however, seems to be a much more suitable candidate for the origins of Alamosaurus, as not only did titanosaurs dominate the continent for practically the entire Cretaceous period, we have evidence of faunal interchange between the two continents. The hadrosaur Cicernosaurus from deserts is thought to be the result of hadrosaurs migrating south from North America via a land bridge. It therefore seems plausible that the ancestors of Alamosaurus could have made the reverse journey north from South America. Sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but I think it's really interesting personally. The actual model looks really good, appropriately restored with some dermal armour it was known to have had at least on some parts of its body. Unfortunately, the coloration isn't that interesting, and they're barely in the episode. We see a 70-ish year old male, who they did a good job of making look old and weathered, collapse onto the beach as his body gives out. A sad way to start, but I am also glad they showed an animal die peacefully of natural causes, as not every death needs to be from predation. The next morning, we see that the old Alamosaurus has passed away, and the scent of the carcass has been picked up by some unnamed troodontids. I don't blame them for not naming these guys, as whilst troodontids are known from Ojo Alamo, none have been referred to a specific genus. Even if they were though, like I said back in Ice World, the validity and classification of North American troodontids is all over the place. Regardless, we see three of these predators try and fail to bite through the tough hide of the Alamosaurus. A Tyrannosaurus then appears and scares the smaller predators off of the carcass. With its powerful jaws, it has no difficulty biting through the tough hide. An interesting aspect of carnivores feeding is them actually processing the kill. I feel this is rarely looked at in much detail, so I applaud this scene for showing it more. Whilst the T-Rex can easily keep the Troodontids at bay, a Quetzalcoatlus then arrives. Nice to see one actually in its known range of southern North America. I have to say, it is really cool seeing a pterosaur of all things challenge a tyrannosaur. This takes the long-held notion that these things were essentially delicate, living, flying kites and throws it out the window. Pterosaurs, especially Ashdarkids like Quetzalcoatlus, were capable, muscular animals in both the sky and on land, and here they are portrayed as such. Whilst it might not seem like much of an adversary for a Tyrannosaurus, its beak could easily poke out the eye or eyes of a T-Rex. For an animal that the show has established is a visually oriented hunter back in swamps, that would spell disaster. The dinosaur doesn't back down, but when a second Quetzalcoatlus appears, we then have the supposed fight scene that was kind of hyped up. It's only brief, but I do think it's well done. I like that we see one get right up in the Rex's face before both take to the sky, pecking at the dinosaur until he surrenders the carcass to them. I wasn't actually a huge fan of this scene when I first saw it, but whilst I do wish we saw more of the Alamosaurus than just the old male falling dead on the ground, the way it then leads into the other events with the Troodontids, Tyrannosaurus and Quetzalcoatlus is good storytelling in my eyes. It does make me hunger even more for that Walking With styled storytelling though, that I wish this episode had been, but I'll take what I can get. The scene has grown on me a fair bit honestly, and I'm now quite fond of it. The second scene takes us to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's on the North American continental plate, I guess it counts. Here we are introduced to the interesting mosasaur, Globidens. Its name means globe teeth, referring to its rounded dentition, presumed to be adapted to crushing armoured prey. 
It was a medium-sized mosasaur, estimated at around 16 feet long. So like in Oceans, we have another weird case here of mosasaur distribution shenanigans. Whilst Globidens is known from North America, all known cases are dated to the earlier Campanian stage of the Cretaceous. Globidens is known from the Maastrichtian, but not in North America. Like with the previous episode, it's possible that Globidens had a broad range, but I have to wonder, why not set this scene where Globidens is definitely known from, and swap this scene with the one from Oceans set in Hell's Aquarium? If anything, that will count more as North America than the Gulf of Mexico anyway. We are then properly introduced to Sphenodiscus, also referred to as Tiger Ammonites by Sir David. The music for this sequence is really good and otherworldly in a way. They are heading to the coast to place their fertilised eggs in the safety of the rocks of the reefs. Okay, back to my previous point about putting this scene in oceans. This scene would then be right before and nicely lead into the scene showing the ammonite eggs hatching in the tide pool. Perhaps if you change the genera around a bit... Uh, I don't know. Prehistoric planet, you really confuse me sometimes, you know that? We then see the Globidens hunt the Sphenodiscus in an interesting way by biting and puncturing the air-filled shells, causing them to sink helplessly. Not only this, but the Mosasaur strategically disables several Ammonites before they all escape, rather than only targeting one. A well thought out and plausible behaviour. This also marks the first time I've seen the soft body of an Ammonite be ripped out of its shell. Brutal, but fascinating. Despite the onslaught, many of the Sphenodiscus escape and place their egg sacs amongst the coastal rock formations. I love that their egg sacs look just like those of modern squid too. That's a great touch. Weird geography aside, I like this scene quite a bit too. I love that we saw Globidens, as it's a very unique Mosasaur, and I'm always happy to see more Ammonite representation. I really enjoyed this one. The third scene is a very interesting one, and my personal favourite of this episode. We are taken, quote, inland only a few hundred miles away to a hypersaline lake cut off from all nearby rivers due to tectonic uplift of the nearby rocky mountains. This, combined with the minerals dissolving within it as the water evaporates, creates a lake of little oxygen and many poisonous substances. Huh, a unique freshwater environment? Okay, since I'm apparently in the habit of rearranging scenes, how about we do a little more? What say, as well as swapping the Globiden scene with the Hell's Aquarium one from Oceans, we place this scene into freshwater, we take the Dinochira scene from freshwater and put it into swamps, and lastly take the Pachycephalosaurus scene from swamps and put it here in North America. I appreciate that fresh water was most likely produced before the season 2 episodes were fully conceived, but even still, am I crazy for thinking this arrangement fits much more neatly for the episode titles? Eh, oh well, back to the episode. Here we are introduced to a very interesting animal indeed, a flock of quote-unquote Stygineta. I am so happy to see this thing here as this animal belongs to a family of birds known as the Presbyornithids, extinct relatives of ducks that are thought to be most closely related to the Screamers. From what I can tell, Stygineta may be a dubious name, but I can barely find a scrap of info online about this thing, other than it is a Presbyornithid known from the Hell Creek Formation. I find it so strange how Prehistoric Planet will sometimes not refer to some animals by a genus name, despite it being fairly confidently known, yet refer to this animal as the problematic name Stygineta, when the safer option would have been to have just called it a Presbyornithid. The narration also describes them as stopping on their travels, so perhaps they're speculating that they're migratory, meaning we may not be in Hell Creek? I don't know. We are also introduced to a troodontid that actually gets name dropped, Pectinodon. Its name means comb tooth, referring to the serrations on its teeth resembling the teeth of a comb. Size estimates are very difficult to determine, as they are only known from teeth. 
That being said, the models are reconstructed based on other genera, and I love both the light brown adult and the Dalmatian-like juveniles. Both they and the Stygianetta are here to feed on the millions of brine flies, whose larvae can feed in and filter out the lake's toxins. With no competition, they can thrive and form huge swarms that are fed on by larger animals. These types of flies are around today. I'm unsure if brine flies specifically were around during the Maastrichtian, but the true flies as a whole had been around since the Triassic. So I'd say it's plausible. We see the juvenile pectinodon run through the swarms with their mouths agape to catch as many as they can. It's pretty cute, honestly. Meanwhile, their father stalks and successfully catches a Stygianetta. When the flock flies off, they really do look like a bird you could feasibly see today, which is fantastic. This is such a unique and interesting scene, and I just love it. A toxic lake is an environment they haven't tackled before, and I think it's such a cool setting. Where this lake actually is, I'm not sure, but it's not really important. We also got two obscure genera for the price of one, and both looked fantastic. Wonderful stuff. In the fourth scene, we head, quote, further north to a pine forest where we see a huge gathering of Triceratops. The males rut to display their dominance to females. We see one young male with particularly large horns show off to a female, but the narration points out that perfect horns mean they have not yet been damaged by rutting, therefore showing a lack of experience. Upon being rejected, a larger, older male, also with enormous horns, arrives and challenges the younger male. I again applaud the creators for giving the Triceratops such diverse and variable horns, as they all look fantastic. The two males rut and they are fantastically animated. You really feel the weight of these two animals as they jostle one another. Eventually, the older and larger male triumphs, breaking one of the horns of the younger male. The detail on the broken off horn is fantastic and looks so detailed and convincing. This scene was well done and very reminiscent of the Taurosaurus lock horn scene from Death of a Dynasty in Walking with Dinosaurs. With that said, it's very short and not that interesting to me. Maybe it's because I've seen ceratopsids rutting many times before that it doesn't pique my interest as much. It's still good stuff, just not a lot here that I haven't really seen before. This brings us to the fifth and final scene of not only this episode, not only season two, but of the show in its entirety for the time being. This scene takes us to the far north, presumably to the Prince Creek formation in Alaska. Here we see a flock of Ornithomimus, and it's nice to see them actually running like they're most famous for. They're searching for newly grown vegetation after the long polar winter. I already talked about how they're not specifically known from Prince Creek, but Ornithomimosaurs are in Ice World. So we'll move straight into the fact that they're being stalked by a female Nanuxaurus. Out in the open, she can only cause the flock to panic, to which they then easily outrun the Tyrannosaur. The feathers fluttering in the wind as they run look amazing and are wonderfully animated. After some snowfall and using the more advantageous terrain of a rocky outcrop, the Nanuxaurus gets a jump start on the Ornithomimus the second time, with one breaking away from the flock and with one unlucky trip the Tyrannosaur catches and kills its prey. The scene and the show ends with her sharing her food with her chicks. See Hank? This is how it's done. I like how the juvenile Nanuxaurus do look quite different to the juvenile T-Rex from Coast too. This scene was well done. The cinematography and filming location for the scene are really great. Similar to the previous scene though, it felt very by the numbers. Still good stuff and well made, but it is ultimately a pretty typical hunt scene, which we've seen several times now. Maybe it's just because it's the last scene of the last episode that by this point I'm just noticing the repetition more. Whilst North America wasn't quite what I was hoping it would be, judging it for what it is and not for what it isn't, I think this episode is solid. It's far from my favourite or anything, and I do think the last two scenes are kind of on the bland side, but I still enjoyed it all the way through. 
Overall, I found Prehistoric Planet Season 2 more polarising than Season 1. I found I had much stronger feelings about Season 2, both positive and, well, negative seems too harsh a word, but rather critical. It had higher highs, but also lower lows, whereas Season 1 felt more consistent in terms of enjoyment for me, at least on the whole. As for which season I prefer, honestly they're equal in quality for those exact reasons, as I feel some episodes end up feeling like less than the sum of their parts. Islands was such a wonderful start. I was not expecting to love it anywhere near as much as I did. The storytelling was wonderful and actually fairly complex for this show's standards, and I love how many obscure animals got some well-deserved time in the spotlight. All the scenes were so excellently executed too. Such a wonderful experience, and I think it actually ranks in first place for season 2. Badlands I considered to be my favourite for a bit. The scenes of Badlands that are good are the best in the entire show in my opinion. The storytelling and drama is magnificent at times. The scene with the Carithoraptor does make this episode dip a bit for me, but not by much, as this episode is stellar on the whole and is a very close second. Swamps is easily my least favourite episode of season 2. As fantastic as it can be at times, this episode features my least favourite scene of the show and the worst effects too in my opinion. This episode also felt very short too, Ignoring the blatant disregard to the actual swamp habitats during the Pachycephalosaurus scene, and judging this episode purely on my enjoyment of the actual scenes, the good stuff just isn't enough to shift it from the bottom position for me. Oceans was such a pleasant surprise for me. Whilst it has a few weaknesses and hiccups, the good stuff is just wonderful, even nostalgic at times. Whilst not quite on par with the first two, this episode comfortably sits in third. North America is extremely consistent in terms of quality, as I like all of the scenes, but none of them really wowed me the way the other episodes did. That being said, it's a solid watch all the way through, and that's what gives it the edge over swamps for me. Now for the very difficult, self-imposed task of ranking all 10 episodes against one another. Now, you may be asking yourself, isn't this a totally pointless exercise attempting to quantify a concept as abstract as enjoyment? Yes. Yes it is. But also, consider the following. Episodes neatly organised by number. Isn't that just really satisfying? With that said, here's all 10 episodes arbitrarily ranked from least to most enjoyed by a stranger on the internet. Number 10. Swamps. Number 9. Forests. Number 8. Freshwater. Number 7. North America. Number 6. Oceans. Number 5. Ice Worlds. Number 4. Badlands. Number 3. Coast. Number 2. Islands. And number 1. Deserts. I went back and forth on these for days. To be honest, you could ask me on a different day and they could all be in slightly different positions. Prehistoric Planet is incredible. It is easily the best paleontology documentary series since Walking With. All episodes of both Season 1 and 2 are available to stream on Apple TV Plus right now. If you don't already have a subscription, they offer a 7 day free trial to new subscribers which you can cancel at any time. This is the best paleo doc in years and you can potentially watch it all for free. If you haven't had the pleasure of watching this amazing series, do yourself a favour and give it a watch. It's worth it just to see the detail on the dinosaur's skin textures alone. It's truly astounding. Thank you so much for watching this massively long video on this awesome show, and I will see you guys next time. Bye bye now.